We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Maybe not quite as many questions as we would hope this week, because we're starting real late. Schedules are what they are, but we'll hit as many as we can. Not much news, yeah, so we can, can pretty me. much skip that you if we wanted me. to. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so... You know, kids. Oh, <laughs> that's that about all is? I can say about that. <laughs> that's basically what happened. Yeah, I, that's all that needs you know, to we, be said. Really, we understand been, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we've been. I mean, it's crazy, right? It's like you know, Mondays, nothing's nothing's really going on. We're trying to talk with the because my son has, like everybody else during COVID, put on a couple of pounds. Ah. so he is pole vaulting, and you have to match the pole to your right. weight. That makes sense. And because it makes sense. So they, they're having a hard time finding a pole. And in fact, there's lots of poles that have gone missing over ah. the years or been whatever. So these, there's not that many to begin with. So we started calling around saying, you know, how much these things mm. cost. Maybe we'll buy them one, blah, blah, blah. Found out there was a guy in, in Florida who like will rent you a pole. Okay. You know, and it, and if the, if you're if you change you know your mm-hmm. weight or if you get better and you need a longer pole, you know you can just swap it out for another one. I think it's a, there's like a swapping out fee, but for like a you can rent it for the, like the season, right. if that makes sense. Yes. So he he comes like that's great. We should do that because it's you know a, a brand new pole. So they like six hundred bucks up and right. up and. and- and way up. Kids still growing, so you're not going to use it forever. So, well, not only that, they, they, they're changing how good they are all right. the time. No. So I'm like, I'm like, well, how much is it to rent? It's like 150 bucks. Okay. I'm like, well, okay, well, I mean, that, that is more reasonable. Like a deal. Yes, he is two and a half hours away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had to drive all the way across Florida <laughs> uh, to the middle of nowhere. Super nice guy. He missed going to the last two Olympics Ooh. in pole vault by like four centimeters. Wow. Okay. I mean, so this guy knows what he's right. doing and he's super nice and uh we have one coach here in this area and i straight up hate that okay. dude like i have never I, you know you, you you meet people and you're like you know what if i were a magnet you would be the op right the, the same polarity as me or something well you know i, I would be repelled <laughs> for i can just feel feel it and then everything that that person has done and so since i've known that person uh uh, everything I, has just made me think mm. my initial reaction was 100% right. Ah. <laughs> I just do not like this dude. So now I'm considering driving two and a half hours every once in a while to go get my son's trained oh, by this guy. Wow. But yeah. we'll see. We'll see. But it was a long, long, long day. I left at 1.30 and didn't get back till just past eight. Sure. So that's because uh, he had to jump a bunch of times and or vault a bunch of times. And then he got a little bit of training while he was there. So... We're going to power through today. All right. We're powering through. That being said, I've been writing a lot of fun stuff over AV Gadgets. Mm. If uh, some of the articles, so I went on a kick, like a Mad at Audio Files kick a couple of right, weeks back, right, and those yep. articles are starting to hit the site. So <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can go back there and have a little good laugh. You know, our, our, our what is it? Our audio files or audio reviewers all liars, I think. There was something the, in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Not trying to stir any pots or anything, but you know me. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell it like it is. All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to avrant.com, uh, leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Contact Rob directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter's at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter's at avrant underscore Tom. If you're watching us on YouTube, where the comments are turned off because mm-hmm. it's just so much easier. <laughs> uh, then you will see our contact information underneath our names. I think that right? is right. Is yeah, we've got a lower Twitter. third. It's well, it's yeah. our Twitter. Our Twitter handles are there. Twitter is down it. there. So if you're, I don't know how he spells reflect. Does he spell it with a Y? <laughs> yes, it's F Y R. No, because that, that's it's the, just the words <laughs> first and reflect, yeah. but they are spelled out. It's not a one S T or something. So yeah. right. So. <laughs> 
uh, you can see it right there, or you can come to the website, check us out there. I uh, want to thank our listeners of the mm-hmm. week to become a listener of the week. Uh, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. That'll send you to a PayPal donation site, and you can use your PayPal account or a credit card to leave us some money, send us some money. So uh, I want to thank... I'm going to go with Jens. Uh, mm. I feel like this is a... It might be like... It might be Jens. Hans. Or Jens. Yeah, it, the name was... The last name made me think, and I didn't look... I can sometimes see addresses, and I didn't even look to see where <laughs> this dude was from. So anyways, Jens, John, Renz, whatever, and then Joseph. <laughs> so both of you, thank you very much for going to... I mean, jo, poor Joseph gets like... Doesn't even, get, <laughs> doesn't even get half the time that poor Jen, that Jens got. And then we're murdering his name anyway, so... Could be. So, I'm going to take a stab at it and say Jens and Joseph. And we're probably up. both wrong. And perchance, are you? Think, is there something with your microphone stand? I'm getting some bumps every time your microphone moves. Just audible, audible little bumpies. Are you really? You shouldn't be because it's on a shock mount. Sometimes, yeah, the shock mount sometimes comes undone. Uh, but no, yeah, I usually move this thing all the time. I, I don't know. have a problem. I'm just hearing little bumpies today, and I don't uh, want let everybody. Me loosen, you know what? Hearing the let little me time. Loosen up the cable there. That should <laughs> that should work. That should work it out. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, this last name, it, he's definitely from, like, Sweden or something like huh? that. You know, you can tell by the O with that looks like a zero. Okay, yes. Denmark. From Denmark. So there we go. I'm sticking with Jens in that case. Jens. Jens and Joseph. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, and we also want to thank our 124 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon's a service that you can sign up to be a supporting member of our podcast community. There, 124 people have decided that they want to support us every month by having Patreon take a little money from them and give most of it to us. So we want to thank our 124 patrons, including Andy. Yeah, for thank sure. Thank you very much, Andy, and the other 123 people. For sure. That is patreon.com slash Podcast for anyone who would like to sign up. It's an automatic monthly donation. You set the amount, and it happens automatically every month. So uh, thanks very much to our 124 patrons over there. And Andy, thank you for being one of them. Okay, I'll, I'll check this out. I, I, I'm now worried about the audio, so I'm checking oh, something. It's, it's been first. okay. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. So uh, if you can't support us financially, we completely understand. Just so do something to support us and let us know what you did, and we'll uh, mention you on the podcast. So Andy gave us a shout-out to Accessories for Less when he bought a refurbished Denon X1600H receiver. Uh, Mike sent some photos to me to, with permission to use them on AV Gadgets. I do not remember getting those pictures. Uh, it would have been a link a link to two pictures, not pictures in the email itself. But uh, mm. I can resend if that... Well, well You might have okay. to, because I don't remember seeing that. I might have seen it and just forgotten about it because it's been, <laughs> you know... I mean, two days ago, I didn't even know there was a pole vault right. rental service. And then today I spent eight hours, well, seven hours of my life getting that done. <laughs> and we also got some good notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from Jason, Aaron, Seth... Jens from Copenhagen. There we see. I just ah. had to keep reading, and they would have shown up. <laughs> Jans, Jens, Ken, Brian, Carl, and Jr. And I'm going to sneeze, so you go. Bob. Okay, uh, Andy, thanks for talking to us up to excess for less. Uh, Mike, thanks for uh, giving Tom permission to use those photos of yours in perpetuity. I've seen them; they're very nice photos. Uh, Jason, Aaron, Seth, Jens, Ken, Byron, not Brian. Byron, Carl, oh, and sorry, uh, Byron. JR. Sorry, Byron. Thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going. The notes of encouragement are very much appreciated. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in questions to the podcast. Uh, we got quite a few after we cleared out the list last week, so it's good. We did. No shortage. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> So we got some corrections here from some of our mm-hmm. listeners, I guess. Ken wanted to clarify that Rob was correct when he said that Xbox Series X can stream Spotify at 320 kilobits per second, but that it is not the de- default. So you have to go into the settings for the Spotify app and change the audio quali- quality audio quality to very high, just to FYI. Yeah. And That's a good note. Mike, That's a good note to know. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. For all the people who actually could get those consoles before all the bots got them for the reseller people it applies to xbox one consoles as well though so there are definitely many yeah. people with one of those and they might be using spotify and not hearing as high quality as is available to them so it's a simple settings right. change inside the spotify app might be worth your time to check and set that to very high uh mike says rob mistakenly said the xbox uh one and C- series s slash x support dolby atmos output but don't use it for games yet that is incorrect 
The mix-up is that Dolby Vision is supported by the hardware, but there haven't been any Dolby Vision games on Xbox uh-huh. yet. So Atmos works and has for quite a while now. So, yes, yeah. it was a slip of the uh, head in uh, where I, I just right. I, the Dolby was there, but uh, I, I, I should got be it drinking mixed coffee. Up. Yeah, but Atmos is working, so yeah. Um, yeah, Mike wanted to share his opinions on it because he's been enjoying Atmos games. So he says it's been a nice upgrade over standard surround sound. And he agrees with us that it won't give you an edge in games, uh, you know, competitive games, even Call of Duty or Battlefield. It's not going to be the difference between winning and losing, but uh, better sense of immersion and games that support it seem to have implemented it quite well thus far. So, oh, yeah, I, could be. Well. You know, as much as I love technology and I love speakers and I love home theater and everything, you know, I'm playing the Oculus Quest, yes. right? And I'm playing the Darth Vader, mm-hmm. the Mortal games, which I just finally finished the third one the other day. Uh, which, by the way, if you are interested in, in uh, if you have an Oculus Quest and you're like, it's like a, you know, 30, 40, 45 minute, maybe hour long quest, why would I spend $10 on it? The, um, the Jedi training rooms, there's mm-hmm. different ones for each one, is worth the price of admission <laughs> for that alone. The third one, in the third one, you get, you, well, I haven't, pl- I haven't done Dojo 2. I've only done, done one and three. And one is just lightsabers. And three is, you can use the force. Mm-hmm. And so my son had played it and beat it. And then I started playing it. And I got out and I looked at him. I said, did you know you can throw your lightsaber? And he goes, Give me that ah. thing. <laughs> so you can throw your lightsaber and it'll go it's like stab a dude yeah. and then you press the button, it snaps you right back, back to your hand. Force, yeah, oh right. my god, you feel like such a boss <laughs> in that game. The lightsaber is is worth it. But the so there's no headphones, right? It just has in the band someplace. Yeah, or in, I don't know where in the headband, the little plastic part yeah. that goes by your temples has two little yeah. slits in it with little little headphone or I don't know, speakers really built in there. And you know, as you were playing that game, you know, because there's people standing in front of you talking to you. Mm-hmm. So you turn to the side and the sound stays with yes. them. And if you turn behind, if you turn backwards, the sound feels like it's coming from behind right. you. These are two 25 yeah. cent speakers, probably <laughs> still able to give you that 3D mm. sense of immersion. And while I, you know, I love Atmos, I just I don't think that having speakers in those places is as necessary as, as having good speakers mm. with good mixes right. so it can be done so yes i agree with what we said and what and mike's yeah i'm agreeing with mike agreeing with us that atmos won't really give you an advantage on the, on the I, field, I would I still think. anyone who's trying to decide between a playstation 5 and an xbox series x i would still say don't worry about the audio and video formats yeah. worry about what games you want to play that makes yeah. a much bigger difference than than that side of things and you know i i like to keep up on game reviewers and stuff like that so i watch a little bit of youtube and some of the youtubes and read some stuff here and there about games and all of that just so i know what my kids are playing Mm. and what they might be interested in when they come to me and they say when they want to play some game i'm Mm. like i i kind of already know what it is um it just doesn't seem like there's very many i mean great games out there right now for these new consoles these for the new, new ones not hit, not yet yeah we're we're waiting on yeah. the exclusive there's a lot of stuff coming come. yes yeah. right you know but like if you didn't want to play like dark souls yeah. remastered yeah. or whatever then you know don't buy the series <laughs> x and if you didn't want to play what is the one on the playstation that everybody's excited about was it was it i don't remember well anyway. demon soul was the one on on playstation 5 which well, oh, okay. that was like a demon playstation Souls. 2 game and this is like completely remastered yes. version of it and then uh spider-man miles Morales was the other big one there's sack boy and right. there's astrobot but like xbox series x doesn't have any exclusive games yet i think i i think they said one one came out and i can't remember what it was but it didn't yeah, have any that's, at that's, launch. that's exciting yeah yeah <laughs> All right, in the news, it says, you'll never guess this, but streaming video subscriptions went up a lot in 2020 for some mm, reason. Mysterious. Yes, this is shocking. Yeah, it was mysterious. What could possibly be the societal impetus for such a change? In Indeed. Viewing things at home. buying things. Oh, it's weird. It's very strange. Very strange. All right, so, uh, Disney originally uh, forecast having 90 million subscribers within four years of launch. They've hit 95 million just over a year. <laughs> Thank you very much, COVID and Hamilton. Right. So, you know, I mean, between those two things. 
<laughs> uh, Netflix broke the 200 million subscriber mark, and HBO, HBO Max, and HBO cable subscriptions combined topped 41.5 million, two years of ahead of projections. In June, HBO Max will expand outside of the USA to Mexico and South America, with Europe following later this year. No plans for Canada yet, though. Since uh, there are already agreements in place to offer almost all of HBO Max's content via other services, albeit not all in one place or in the highest quality, so... Sorry, again. Yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed. I mean, with the announcement HBO made of all the Warner Brothers 2021 movies uh, being available on the streaming service, not quite sure how that's going to happen in Canada because content is spread around. I mean, there's even some of it on Netflix because they signed deals with Netflix Canada to distribute some of the shows that are on HBO Max through Netflix Canada. So, um, yeah, deals are in place. Not sure what's going to happen there. We might just have to pay for them piecemeal and download them from iTunes or something. But uh, mm. anyway, it's good. That's uh, services coming to some other countries outside of the USA, hopefully one day to Canada. And uh, yeah, Disney Plus seems to be doing all right. So You think yeah. so? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So they're going to catch up to Netflix uh, at this rate. They are going to. The uh, Once they start getting more of their original content out, that's what's really hurting them is right. that they're only using their own their own library. And that while it is extensive and then it's just not, doesn't have quite the 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 poll but once they start getting the star wars and all the marvel out, shows like, that's gonna add to it for sure Mar wandavision if that's you right. are not watching Mar Mar wandavision my wife is <laughs> absolutely glued to that ah, tv nice. she loves it she makes me rewind stuff and explain yeah. it to her she's like she goes who how come everybody's excited about that i'm like okay hold on a second <laughs> let me tell you about how <laughs> 23 Fox... other movies <laughs> <laughs> remember age of ultron no okay right. <laughs> let's, let's well it's on it disney again. plus you could go watch it <laughs> we we try. we started uh doing the chronological order right watching them in the chronological order so it's Starting uh with captain america captain yeah. america then captain marvel yeah. and then whatever whatever uh so yes we we started doing that but she wasn't really too interested in that, but she mm. loves WandaVision. Cool. She just loves it. And it's it's just the perfect type of show for her <laughs> because she doesn't have the type of – she doesn't pay that close of attention okay. to things that are going on. So the little comedy format, the right. little sitcom thing, and then when things get weird, she's like – it <laughs> perks her up. So it's been really good. I'm not going to give any spoilers. I'm going to tell you it is – you've got to watch it. It's really good. <laughs> Uh, some comments from listeners here. Aaron just wanted to mention that he ordered uh, DIY panel materials uh, from Gick, and those shipped out quickly and arrived within a couple of weeks. So while they are backed up uh, on orders for completed panels, if you just want DIY supplies from Gick, that seems to be okay. I already forgot twice that I have ordered from them yeah. and I have not heard a single mm. thing from them at all. Well, period. Fingers crossed. Hopefully soon. Jr. wanted to share his most recent updates to his theater. He bought two SVS PC 2000 Pro cylinder subs during their President's Day sale. He got them from their uh, outlet store, so he expected some minor blemishes, but they appeared to be pristine. So with a seal, he says. They even gave him a free T-shirt. I do not have an SVS T-shirt. <laughs> I do not. The man who literally wears nothing but right. T-shirts. I have a 2020 t-shirt that says one star zero out of ten would not recommend <laughs> all i do is wear t-shirts and i don't have an sbs dude just so email JR, nick i am sure he would send you one i am not doing that i don't <laughs> i don't not doing that i'm not doing it i've gotten plenty of speakers from them they could have That's a t-shirt in that box <laughs> could have been the backing material. so he positioned <laughs> he positioned them just like we said to one directly beneath his right surround speaker just behind the midpoint uh, of his room and the other on the left side just in front of the midpoint uh midway point of his room and he painted it. dark gray on the front wall behind the tv really makes the images pop he was a bit surprised at the difference so he highly recommends it uh he's just waiting on get on his gig panels now and then the room will be completed so let me see here i'm scrolling mm -hmm. i'm scrolling oh yeah it looks nice it does it looks real it looks nice. Real nice. It's very nice. Yep. And I like that cylinder slubs also subwoofer nice. placement. And uh, man, that fits perfectly below his surround speaker on the right hand side. Yeah, so. just just right there too. It looks it? just right. Well, are those RBHs? What are those speakers? B and W. B and W. Yes, Bowers yeah. and Wilkins. All right, All right, all right. Some uh, questions here. There we go. Uh, this is a theater that has been in on. That's Mike. As the, <laughs> as the couple of times. I think I may have used his pictures. Maybe are these are the pictures yeah, that he sent. The that I can yeah, use. Yeah, with permission. Oh well, I need I need these because I'm gonna. I just I think I just reused one that was like I wish I had another picture of a theater <laughs> and I'm gonna use the one with the seats. There you go. 
That's going to be good. Okay. Anyways, uh, Mike says, Mike told us how he was disappointed with his upgrade to his SVS Ultra Center because he occasionally hears some harshness regardless of volume levels. Yes, we remember that. This is a really nice It theater. is a very, Mike, very I'm... nice theater that he built himself. This was not uh, yes. not hiring someone. He put in all the wainscoting. Those are filled with insulation. The whole back wall is treated. The front wall setup looks really nice now. And all SVS speakers in there and two rows of seats, recliners, back row on a riser. All done by him. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. When COVID's over, you're invited to my house to come fix my theater. <laughs> make it pretty like this because I'm not going to do it. So you wonder, we wondered if it might actually be a case of truly of him hearing truly linear, accurate sound for the first time at home since there are a lot of TV shows and movies out there with less than stellar audio quality. Mike wanted to run some more experiments with the rest of his speakers, possibly sw swapping out the center speaker wire since it was run pre-run inside the walls and taking some measurements to see if anything stuck out like a sore thumb. He previously reported that he hadn't... Sent uh, hasn't ever noticed the same sort of occasional harshness from any of the other speakers in the 7.2.4 setup with two pairs of side surrounds. Well, we might have been on to something. He has listened to just his front pair of FCS Pinnacle Towers playing in stereo before, but only with music. He decided to give a Phantom Center a try with movies and TV. First, he says, wow, the imaging is spot on. And he had a hard, he had to get that multiple times to make sure a center speaker wasn't actually playing. I know, dude, that, it's so weird. The effect fell apart if he moved uh, to one of his, the, his seats to either side, but the, in the middle seats, he can see why we say that the center speaker is the least important. That's right, we wrote an article about it. Uh, quickly switching back and forth between center speaker on center speaker off the phantom the sound is not identical though he can't really say one sounds better versus or what right versus wrong but there is an audible difference more than that though while using the phantom center some of the that occasional harshness was still present he never heard it coming from his towers with music but with certain movies and tv shows that harshness was there just like with the ultra center so maybe it really is just the in the recordings themselves once again though quickly sh switching back and forth the harshness wasn't identical it was present either way but not exactly exactly the same then again his pinnacle towers are only slightly towed in so he isn't bang on the axis to them the way he is with ultra center so to start off with he's giving it a try with the center aiming straight forward instead of tilted upward to aim straight at his face that should put him a little bit off axis similar to his towers he's hoping that that might mellow a bit of the harshness and also get the timbre sounding closer to identical if he switches quickly between the phantom center and the center speaker on but do we have any other ideas? It's fine to know he's probably just hearing truly <laughs> accurate sound, harshness and all. But he didn't spend all this money to go through all this effort to be bothered by what he's hearing. So how does he get the timbre match across the front three perfect? And can anything be done to mitigate that occasional harshness, even if it's the recording's fault? Uh, okay, first of all, perfect timbre match mm. across the front three is not a thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Even if it's I, 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 literally three identical three speakers, identical speakers, all that's vertical, right. yeah. all at yeah. your height, just the yeah. difference in position in the room can mean that even in that scenario where you've given right. yourself every possible chance of having a literally perfect tamper match, it still isn't always literally perfect. So. Right. It just, I mean, it, it, it can be something as simple as just how close the walls are to it. Right. You know, so your side speakers are close to walls. Therefore, you're getting a little bit different. Uh, they may be angled slightly differently. There's all sorts of other things that can be perfect tamper matching across the front is not really a thing. What you're really looking for is when there's a pan in mm -hmm. the music or whatever, or the, am I hearing the difference between one speaker and another? And your ears are extremely forgiving for that. <laughs> um, I know Rob's crazy about it, yeah. but the reality is I've had an RBH center channel that I used with like 12 different pairs of speakers and it was fine for 11 of them. <laughs> one of them not yeah. so much but 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 that one has a, had a completely different sound yeah. to it and you can i mean it's it sticks out like a sore thumb when it's there because a, it, a it's, car it's will drive so. across your screen and it sounds like a different car when it goes through yeah. the center speaker versus the other two <laughs> it's like, if you want get this car has towers and it gets to this this car this car has tires and then it gets to the center it's like nope no tires and then it goes to the other other speaker yeah there's the tires yeah. again if you're not getting tires that kind of noticeable difference in a pan like that um then and 
then it's not an issue. Then you have a good enough timbre match that is convincing in the illusion that you're listening to the same object going across the front soundstage. That's really the right. goal. Um, so yeah, aiming for absolute perfection, as in literally switching between phantom versus not phantom. Uh, th that right. that Don't drive yourself crazy about that because no matter what you do, even if you took your screen down and put in another pinnacle right in the middle there, uh, you might not achieve that. So that, that might be a driving yourself crazy scenario uh but honestly the the, like the part where you say okay i'm willing to believe that the harshness i'm hearing once in a while is just the recording's fault but i don't enjoy that uh you know like fair enough because yes you put a lot of money and time and effort into putting together this theater and you want to enjoy all things that you watch so i mentioned before when this came up the last time that honestly the the easiest thing to me to try since it's free to try uh is to just bust out that odyssey editor app and yeah. manually put in a high frequency roll off because it tends that's exactly what i was, was going to yeah, suggest it, it tends to be the high frequency that would have any of that harshness in it uh it also can let's say well i mean you can say the word help uh your imaging sound even more um like widen the sweet spot basically because again it's the highest frequencies that are the most directional and therefore the most different from the seats to your sides versus the seat in the middle once you roll off the high frequencies a bit uh it tends to widen the sweet spot as well so um with it might as well help with that harshness too. that's right uh, yeah yeah. That, that I mean, that's the easiest thing to try because you've got the app right there and it is just a matter of trying it. And plus, uh, even though with the AV receiver you have, it's not one of the newest models that lets you store two different runs of Odyssey and just switch back and forth easily within the receiver itself, you can still store more than one Odyssey run in the app itself and use the save and load process so if you're like hey i love the way this sounds for music and i don't want to roll off any high frequency detail when i'm listening to music so therefore i don't want to have a high frequency roll off all the time well you can have that stored in the app and load that when it's music time and then when it's movie time or tv time and you're like oh this is one of those darn recordings where i'm hearing harshness in it you load up the one where you've put in a high frequency roll off on your speakers and that would be the way to come at it yeah, that's probably what I would do too. I still think it's probably worth it to um, uh, switch out the speaker wire. Just oh, just to, to give it a try, it. sure. Yeah, yeah, just to give it a try. But now that uh, he's heard it from be... the Pinnacle Towers as well, it's, right? Yeah, yeah, lending more credence to the idea. It's probably in the recording itself. And it's not a bad idea too to just try because uh, he's already tried this a little bit by straightening out the the, the, the center channel, but mm -hmm. by maybe even angling it slightly down. Mm -hmm. So that you're a little bit even more off axis. Right. And then with your pinnacle towers, you know, flatten those out a little bit too. So they're, you're a little bit more off mm. axis to them yeah, as well. Yeah, because he's got that the, might tame the, harshness the foam wedgies as, so he could just well. turn the foam wedgies around the other way. So that instead of yes. angling up, they angle back down. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to give it a, just to give it right. a, I mean, it also works by angling the thing above your head, but that would just mm. look silly. I mean, it's going to look silly anyways, but whatever. No one's looking at it but you. Brian, we discussed Brian's basement, which is roughly 15 feet wide by 30 feet long, but it has part of, of uh, the concrete foundation jutting in on the right-hand side, basically in the middle of that 30-foot length, which determines where the theater area gets separated from the bar and games area at the back. Right. A weird wall thing. A little bit, remember. yeah. I mean, it's, it's really not a very large chunk of wall, but it's a significant piece of concrete sticking in, so you can't really work your way around that in the design of the room too much. I just wonder what the heck is up with that thing, because it doesn't connect to the ceiling. Like, mm. what is it doing, and why is it there? Well, we're not <laughs> you know, seeing the it, very far end of it, so maybe it... Maybe it connects I, I know. To there, I'm just. I'm wondering if it has to be there because <laughs> you know you could just maybe get rid of it and then. That looks like a significant piece of concrete that I don't think. I'm was not just... saying it's going to be easy. I mean, but I just don't know why it's there. Yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't look like the structural. sort of thing that was put in for no reason at all. <laughs> but it is though. But look at there's like I know it's not on trophies uh, on top or I'm something. Not, I can't I'm even tell exactly what's sure. up there. I don't know. Well, I'm just gonna say, dude. First of all. <laughs> If it doesn't need to be there, 
then maybe you just get rid of it, and then now you have a regular room like everybody else, and you don't have a weird Definitely half concrete don't wall. Don't do that unless an engineer and city well, inspection tells you. I would talk to somebody. You. Yes, no. I would talk to the somebody and say, "What is this thing?" And <laughs> can I get rid of it? And somebody will definitely have an answer to that question. Yeah. It's not us, but I, it's, I highly doubt yeah. that it can be taken out. I tell me what possible use could that thing have? I, I it don't doesn't know. connect to the ceiling. It must be something. Weight distribution of something. I don't know. I think it's a distribution of we were going to put a wall here and then we changed our minds. <laughs> That's what I think it is. Anyways, uh, he let us know that most of the time it'll just be his family watching. So we said to have, uh, so we said to forget about a permanent back row of recliners, which would have forced him to have a shorter viewing distance to the, in the front row, and just put a, uh, put bar stools back there instead. And we also said that it would make sense to keep all of his home theater equipment at the front of the room and either go with an eighty-five inch flat panel or spring for an ultra ultra la la, la ult, UST projector, yes. <laughs> ultra short throw. Thank you, since I cannot say it today. <laughs> since we doubted this room would ever be even be pitch black for a standard projector, well, Brian is on board and decided he'd like to have about a nine and a half foot viewing distance from the front row. So a 110 inch screen with a, a UST projector, Optima Cinema XP2 is what he has in mind. Assuming we we're in agreement, which screen should he get? He looked up UST screens and we found more expensive. Yep. Is there anything we can recommend that is on the more affordable side? So, yes, uh, I wrote an article about that. You did. Not I, specifically I did. just about UST screens, but all different screen right. types, including ultra short throw screens. So, any, any ambient light rejecting screen that is designed for a, a ceiling, you know, or a, a, a UST or short throw projector uh is going to be different than just a regular ambient light rejecting yes. screen so an ambient light rejecting screen what happens is the the light that comes directly from in front of it gets bounced back and out like normal but at things that come from the sides and top and mm -hmm. bottom or are supposed to be rejected so you can't just pair that with your ust projector because it's coming from a, the bottom yes so it'll be rejected so you need to have one that accepts light from the bottom or if you find a, and there are some out there that are meant for, you know, like a ceiling mount one, like the they have it in the classrooms. Sure. At, and all you do is turn the screen upside down. Right, yes. <laughs> okay. So it's just, it doesn't really matter what it, orientation it was, but as long as you put the projector on the right side. Uh, so I know that the the best ones that are out there are the Loon Vision yeah. ones. They are expensive here. Yeah. And they're hard to find. Yeah. Like Amazon is often not carrying them right. at all. And 110 in particular, uh, a lot of these UST projectors are really designed with 120 in mind. Yeah. You know, it seems to be 100 and 120. It's like yeah. either or. Right. And I would recommend moving your seats back and doing a 120 versus... Okay trying to have a one well i mean even if you went for you may not 120 at the nine and a half foot mark yeah that's still it's fun. still gonna be fine or if make it 10 feet and 120 is right, gonna be right. fine. right we're not talking about you're not talking about moving the five feet no, back. no no but the i don't even know if you'll be able to find the 110 inch screen <laughs> to be honest with you tricky, and that yeah. might be one of what might be one of your problems with having things so expensive that you're like well for 110 mm. i gotta spend yeah you're looking for a 120 okay. you're looking for a 120 so I would point you to Elite Screens. Uh, they're going to be the most affordable. They have a series called CLR for Ceiling Light Rejection. Now, there are three right. different versions. I'm not exactly sure why. they. Well, one of them is obvious, but the original CLR, the one that is just called Elite Screens CLR or Starbright CLR, it's actually the first one they made and the most expensive. It has a, a, a literal sawtooth shape to the screen itself so that it only reflects on the angled part. So the light is shining up, hitting the angled part of the sawtooth. And then the flat part of the sawtooth on top is just light absorbing <laughs> material. So that is the original and the most expensive. Uh, now that one is available in different sizes, but like the 120 is sold out right now. Um, right. They've got the 103 in stock. The, the reason it's 103 is that normally be a 100, but they've gone for like a really, really skinny border. So that they kind of fudged it up to a 103. <laughs> but uh, the right. 103 is in stock. Um, now, what is that one going for? Uh, uh, $878 800. right now? Yeah, it's a lot. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's about as cheap as it gets, other than the next one in line, which was the CLR2. The CLR2 is the least expensive. Now, it does not have the sawtooth shape on its screen. It is a flat screen, uh, which some people prefer because you can actually clean a flat screen. It's very uh, dangerous <laughs> to try and clean the sawtooth ones. It's You can damage those screens very easily. So the CLR2 was more about being a more durable, more easily cleanable screen. It does its ceiling light rejection via optical coatings instead of the actual physical three-dimensional shape of the screen. So again, that one, the 103 is in stock. Nothing else is. It's $732 for the 103 size. So maybe you sit at nine feet from a 103 and you keep about the same uh, viewing. I mean, this is strictly because if you just want to purchase it now, this is what's in stock. Things seem to be out of stock and in shortage. Now, they do have a third one, which is the, you might have guessed it, CLR3. The CLR3 is also got a sawtooth thing, but they're using a different coating on the light absorbing part, and it's not quite as absorbent as the original CLR. I'm not really sure why there is the CLR original and the CLR3. They're kind of coming at it in the same way. Uh, but I mention that because uh, a st- uh, play online place called Projector Screen Store, they actually have the 120-inch size of the CLR3, but... The price on it is fifteen seventy eight. I mean, it's twice the price. In fact, a bit more than the CLR two at the one hundred three inch size. Right. So, if you want the least expensive, move your seat six inches closer and go with a one hundred three, uh, either the original CLR or the CLR two. If you are thinking that you might ever want to wipe this screen down, then the CLR two is actually the better choice on that. But the ones that have the sawtooth design are more effective. So, if your room is going to be dim, you know, not pitch black but dim, the CLR two is going to be great. Uh, if you're going to have some fairly significant ambient light, it might be better to go for the sawtooth one. That would be my advice. Okay. Yeah, I... Uh, it, it's... This is sort of why, for at least right now, I'm very strongly looking at, for people who want a UST projector, like, move your chair closer and get a flat panel because you're going to be spending <laughs> well, about the same amount or he, less. That's what he asked about. Yeah. But, you know, 85 versus 120, that's a big difference. That's a big difference, yeah. But, you know, in the end, you only really want it to fill up so much of your vision. Yeah. You know, no matter w- how big the actual physical screen is, if you're sitting close enough to it, it's still filling up the same amount sure. of your vision if it's smaller. So I, uh, this is also a time where you... You sit on, you know, Amazon and check every day, right? And get some sort I mean, of alert. These things or something will like that. come back in stock they eventually. It's just we don't really know when. It's not super predictable because there's been so many manufacturing, you know, interruptions throughout last year. So everybody's playing catch up. But honestly, 103 versus 110 is not such a huge difference and sitting six inches closer is not, you know, the end of the world. So that might be pretty reasonable because that keeps the price very reasonable and you can actually get one at 103. And you can bet that the 120 screens are going to come back. Yes. The 100 and the 120 screens are going to come back before anything else does because those are the top selling sizes. For sure. So, you know, if you really wanted to go this direction, I would just decide what screen you really want, you know, knowing what it's going to eventually cost. And uh, just wait until it comes out. That's what I would do. I don't know how to say this name. Joyter? Uh, I think it's Joter. 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 I think so. All right. All right. Cool. Joter is looking for a subwoofer advice. His theater area is, oh, you know, I'm sorry. We don't really do subwoofers here. (laughs) Never heard of We only talk. We never. (laughs) We we recommend full range speakers for every position, including Atmos. (laughs) That's right. You should be, you should be, you should be at, you should be stringing up full size, full range speakers on your ceiling, please. Thank you. Joy Tur is looking for a subwoofer advice. This theater area is twenty three feet long and eighteen and a half feet wide. Theater area, mm-hmm. but there is a seven and a half foot opening at the back of the uh, into another room that is thirty feet long as well. Yeah. So I guess it's he lives in a hallway uh there's a soffit running from the back along the right side but the rest of the ceiling is eight and a half well just over eight and a half uh feet high so in total he's dealing with about 8400 cubic mm-hmm. feet and there's no guarantee that there's not no more hallways coming off of this thing so maybe <laughs> this more. is what's been described to us 
All right, the whole space was designed to be a media and entertainment room without the theater being closed in, but aesthetics are very important, and he originally wanted just one or two compact sealed subs. Yeah. I bet you did. <laughs> he's been reading and asking questions online, and he's been told that he really should go ported. Mm -hmm. But he do also doesn't want to break the bank, and some of the less expensive ported models definitely seem to sacrifice looks and compact size. Yeah, he's if you been... went across HSU, that is, I can't call it a looker. That is high yeah. value output for dollar, but I would yeah. not call it compact or beautiful. <laughs> well, power sound audio. Indeed. <laughs> you know? Those are big I, 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 black I'll be honest with boxes. you. The ported the 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 pb 1000 is like one of my least favorite subs to look at <laughs> and almost all as much as i love svs the one driver off to the side thing mm -hmm. just it it just messes with me man <laughs> you got to put it in the middle and then i don't like the triangular ports that that's, are on those some of those HSU, hsu ones yeah. too man yeah. just just like it was like you know what we just we're, we're not going to sacrifice the labor to make a round hole here just <laughs> slice it with three things I'm like what? who made this thing zorro <laughs> all right he's been considered jl audio svs rel and paradigm he's heard examples of all three uh, i'm sorry of the first three but he doesn't have any way to audition the paradigm sub and they're all ported anyway his top concern is accuracy and articulation so what advice can we offer him what do we think he should get uh okay so you're not going to get pressurized bass in this room so well, not with there. a compact sealed sub. Well, I mean, it's not entirely impossible if you went SB16 Ultras, uh, if you went JL Audio F them. Series. Um, yeah, the, the, the Gothams or whatever they are. Yeah, the fam, I mean, at least the, fam. the Fathoms, you know, probably the Fathom yeah. 13s. But the problem there is, one, they're still not tiny. I mean, they're no. definitely more compact than, say, a Power Sound Audio 18-inch ported sub. Definitely more right. compact than that. But they're still not tiny, but we're not doing the not breaking the bank anymore. You are, oh, you yeah. are paying through that the nose the <laughs> to get that level of output. You have at been that bank size. robbed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely have an idea that I don't know if he's considered because if he hasn't come to us, he probably hasn't had it suggested to him. And that would be cylinder subs because yeah, yeah. cylinder subwoofers, I mean, they don't have the big boxy look because they're cylinders. Uh, if it was a matter of floor space, it's only a 16 and a half inch diameter circle. And now, and now they come with wood tops. They come with nice looking so, wood tops. It's so you could like put something on top of it and dress it up a little yeah, bit if you want. It's a to. fabric wrap, uh, you know. So they're they're if you brush against no hard them, edges. they're kind of soft. Yeah. There's no yeah no hard edges. They come with isolation feet already installed. So that's an added bonus for the price that you pay. Right. Now I would be pointing you at the PC four thousand because you're dealing with eighty four hundred yeah. cubic feet. The other cylinder model that SVS offers is the PC two thousand Pro. Which hey, if that's the price you've got, it's still a reasonable choice. You might have it turned literally as high as it will go, and it still might <laughs> not be loud enough. But the wonderful thing about SVS subs is that they won't break themselves even with the volume as high as it will go. But for the amount of air that you've described, the 4000 series would be better. Now they're $1,800 each, but if you want to actually contend with 8,400 cubic feet of air, that's the kind of price point that you're going to be looking at. I mean, the, the least you might be looking at would be around $1,500 and then you're massively sacrificing looks. So... Uh, definitely right. consider an SVS cylinder sub. That That's my top choice because that allows you to get output that can contend with your volume of air with a small footprint and I think sleek looks. I mean, if you've got, you know, he said he's got a half wall at the back of his room. Like this can go yeah. in one of the corners, you know, where nobody's really looking and in a shadow, it's totally just going to disappear back there. So that's, okay. If you are, so first of all, you're, you want two subs. Ideally, yeah, yeah but I mean, price ideally, might preclude you, it. So. Yeah, at least. But and then the perfect spot for your subs are midpoint of the side walls, and yeah. it's not midpoint within your theater area, but midpoint of the entire area. Yeah. And like Rob said, you have some half some walls or something, some half walls, right in the middle of your whole room. Yeah. So just so like put them on one side of you know so in in front of the half wall on the right side and then behind the half wall on the left side and that's where your two subs or it could go. be like the two rear corners of your theater area but could that's you know it's close to the, close the middle yeah. of the side points of the entire space now 
if you're just like, no way, no how am I getting four foot tall cylinders uh, into my room? There's there's just no way I'm going to do that. I will only accept a sort of cubicle shaped compact thing. Uh, ones I might point you to would be Golden Ears Super Sub series. Uh, these yeah. have two powered drivers and two squarish shaped passive radiators. So they aren't technically sealed. These are a passive radiator instead of a port. Um, Which, you, yeah, acts very similarly yeah, to a port. Yeah, acts similar to a port, but allows for a little bit more compact size. Uh, these are dual opposed arrangements, so there's very little physical vibration going on. Now, I would be pointing you at the biggest one they make, which is the Super Sub XXL, extra, extra large. And I mean, even though it's compact, it's not tiny. I mean, it's basically an 18 inch cube. It's, it's not quite like 19 by 17 by 15, but they're $2,200 each. I mean, it's cheaper than some of the other things out there. It's cheaper than the JL Audios, for example. Uh, but, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're paying to get down to that size with that kind of output. Uh, Power Sound Audio does have a dual opposed 15 inch model. Uh, that's like the smallest sub that <laughs> Power Sound Audio makes. Uh, so that is their S3012. Uh, so the 30 is two fifteens. Um, but I mean, that one is $2,100 in the basic black finish. This is one of the few subs that Power Sound Audio offers with uh, other finish options. So if it's a matter of the finish option, uh, you can pay $200 more, $2,300. It's a big, that's a big, sub. but it's, yeah, 18 it's by 18 by 24 by, by 22 and a half. It is, it is, it's a big, it not it's 110 pounds. That's right. But I mean, these are the types <laughs> of subs that you need to contend with this volume of air. So, right. um, those are sort of like the, the most compact, uh, but I mean, the cylinder wins on, in terms of footprint and in my opinion, looks. And you may not have heard this before, but we say all the time in this podcast, you can get, uh, loud and low, uh -huh. you can get small mm -hmm. and you can get cheap. Mm. You pick two. Only two. You yes, cannot you cannot get, get all three. <laughs> okay, so it, it it you are asking for small, uh, and in and you need something loud right. enough to fill up this space that you have. So and if not you too say, so that, right. that's trying to get all three, and it's that's so you can't have all three. Happen. So th our suggestions here are all having the first two. Right. Uh, and then we're sacrificing the inexpensive part of it. Uh, the upside with SVS, and I don't know where you live or you know how it works where you are, but um, first of all, I would not worry about Paradigm. Mm. Their subs are fine or they're not fine. I don't really They've care. They've got some all the other ones that, good ones, but yeah. It's, yeah, it yeah. gets up there in price to get the really good ones. Yeah, and you can that money is better spent on the stuff that we've recommended, mm. uh, that Rob's recommended. Your other option, and this is not what we would recommend as far as trying to get you know the the uh, good even base across your entire room, and you know getting all the frequencies represented as they should be, uh, would be if you said I have a thousand dollars and I'm going to get two little subs and I need to aim to be you know. 12 inch cubes <laughs> <laughs> okay well okay if you decide to do something like that we of course can't stop you and uh but we would then not say put them in the back of the back of your theater area like we just did because these things are going to get lost mm. something small like that is just going to get lost so you got your cheap and you got your small but you didn't get your loud loud and low mm -hmm. so in that case i would probably have them flank your couch sure. or your area your theater area just so they are physically closer to you so that you have I a mean, better chance of actually being able to hear them maybe you even way, go tactile transducers at that point but right tactile transducers is going to be money to, to do it it's not like they're free and they are setting they are not up. only are they not free they're not as easy to set yes. up as you think they're going to yeah. be that's the part that's the that's when i started researching them for the article i wrote uh i was surprised how many problems they created right. like i thought that it was going to be uh no big deal i thought <laughs> it was going to be you know just connect them and you know bob's your uncle uh but it ends up being and you can ends up spending more than it would cost you exactly. just to buy some subwoofer yeah. so but we'll have the article know. that tom wrote about tactile transducers uh linked in case you're interested in them right all right dale dale is looking to put together a dedicated 2.1 system for critical music listening he i'm sorry sir we don't do that here <laughs> we only do subwoofers <laughs> sorry dale this is the wrong podcast <laughs> We only talk about subs, sub placement, and how big a sub we can we possibly mm. get you to buy. That's all we talk about here. <laughs> 
Dale is looking to put together a dedicated 2.1 system for critical uh, music listening. He's given uh, wide budget ranges between $2,000 and $7,000, but didn't specify his room size or whether it's an enclosed room, uh, which is an important point. Yes. I know that you only have the two speakers in there, and you're thinking, oh, I just have two speakers with a subwoofer. You know, I'm, I just put them and everything's fine. No, your room matters. Yep. Your room is 50% sure. of your sound. I don't care that it's only 2.1 sound. The music doesn't care either. I mean, chances okay. are most people, because, I mean, uh, he's got a second question talking about having a theater room as well. So chances are if he's setting up in a second room for a dedicated two-channel listening system, most people aren't doing that in an enormous room. But right. sometimes... I would think it's an office or bedroom. Yeah, sometimes I, people are. Sometimes people are like, my theater is in a relatively small, dedicated room that I can enclose, and my two-channel system is in my wide-open great room that's open to my kitchen and dining area and to a loft upstairs. So we don't know. It is significant, but uh, we'll, we'll work on sort of relatively small setup assumptions. Right. And I will tell you this. Uh, I considered and i have many times considered having a two channel system set up in like a living room sure so i've got my home theater which is where my tv lives and we don't have any i don't have tvs in any of the bedrooms including my bedroom it's just this is the only place we watch that sort of content mm. you know uh people might watch youtube or something on the computer or their laptop or a, a phone or tablet but we don't do hulu streaming and all the Netflix streaming in any place other than this room. And I thought I'd, I'd just take a couple of nice speakers, put them in that in the home theater, I mean, the living room area, and then they would be used for music. So I could see this could be a bigger room too. So he'll need speakers, a sub, a turntable, need is a strong word there, CD player, and a radio tuner. He's thinking uh, a separate preamp and amps, amp with tubes or a mix of tubes and solid state would be cool. <laughs> What brands would we recommend looking into? And if we have any specific model numbers that we'd highly recommend, you'd like to hear them. Uh, yeah. So knowing the size of the room will make a big difference here. Indeed. A massive, massive difference here. Because uh, we'll tell we'll tell in how far away you're sitting and everything else. Tell, tell us how big of a subwoofer you need. Mm -hmm. Or you know, also tells it would be nice to know if it's just going to be you in one seat that you will never, ever move. I mean, it seemed like this was just for him. So the yeah. notion of one subwoofer, as long as you're able it's to fine. do a sub crawl and position it well for that one seat, I don't have any beef with that. Uh, but if this yeah. was meant to be for a larger audience area, then you're going to want to have dual subs. But working on the assumption of one sub is not out of the question at all. So as far as uh, separate preamp and amp with tubes and all this other stuff, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you, this is this is what I would do. I would go to Accessories for Less, get myself a nice receiver okay. that does all the things I want it to do or I need it to do. And most of them have phono inputs mm -hmm. and everything these days, so you don't have to worry about any of that. I would go to Audio-Technica, and I would pick out one of their oodles of turntables. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I would... Because they've got everything from the audio file, audio file grade to you know the you know the entry level consumer level stuff uh they've got bluetooth bottles and stuff that can stream the, the content from the whatever and if you uh want to take yourself even a cursory glance at a lot of the other popular turntables out there you might go man that looks exactly like the audio technica ones except for two or three times the price point and that's what they are <laughs> that's what they are uh and you know they even have the ability to switch out the tone arms oh, and all this course. other stuff yeah. so they've got they, they you know they're they are very good and and reasonably priced. Yes. Uh, I would then buy a device that had tubes in it <laughs> that lit up. Okay. I and see. I would put it near all the rest of the stuff that you're <laughs> you're buying. Uh, because you know, having tubes is fine, but uh, you know, what we our solid state and you know our amplifier technology that we have these days mm. in uh, is clean it's it gives you a pristine signal uh good amplification and there's no real reason other than aesthetics to have tubes so if you like the way that tubes look then buy some tubes and make them light up somehow and then put it near the stuff that actually does the work um the radio player would be inside the AV receiver the radio tuner would be inside the av receiver uh speakers in the sub again it would it'd be very much very helpful to um no room size to know your room size and then a cd player and boy if i can't just say 
you, you sure you don't have something that already plays a CD in your house? Because I feel like everything <laughs> does. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I don't, uh, I don't really have a suggestion for, I know uh, a specific suggestion for CD players. Okay. Um, well, I've got one in my list. I put together a, okay. a whole list of what I would do with this budget, uh, specifically for a two point one channel system that's never going to be expanded to surround sound. Uh, oh my God, look at this list. Yeah, I, I don't have any tubes. My lord, I, I don't have any tubes <laughs> in there, Dale. Uh, I went for performance. Not not looks, and I also wanted something where I'm actually going to have the amplifier power that I might want for full dynamics. Well, that's the thing. You know, you get you get the tube amp, and it has like five that's watts. Right. What, what are you going to do with five watts? I mean, most sounds, of the time it's fine. It also sounds but... a little bit different every time you use it because that's what yeah, tubes do. Unless you leave it on. <laughs> I want consistency. Right. I want linearity. I want good performance. So, uh, what I went for first, and this is my only choice for pre-amplifier. It actually is. An integrated amp. It has amplifiers built in, but for a reason that I'll explain in just a moment, um, I went for uh, using this as a preamp, and that is Marantz's NR1200. Uh, it is two channel only, but it has pre outs for the two channels and two subwoofer pre outs, although they are not independent. That is just an internal Y splitter. But I want to have HDMI inputs on anything I've got these days because that is the best quality uh, signal that you can input there, including you might want to just get an Amazon Fire. TV Cube, because if you want to do streaming services, although this Marantz already has a lot of streaming services built in, so I would start with those, but, um, you know, you, you might want to get a service that isn't built in, and an Amazon Fire TV Cube is a great way to do it, and that only has an HDMI connection, so uh, that's what I went for there. Uh, for amplification, I would go straight to Emotiva's uh, Base X A300, that's 400 uh, bucks. Socks. So, uh, yeah, the Marantz NR uh, 1200, by the way, is 650. Uh, there are a couple of them in stock at Amazon right now, so uh, might want to grab it real fast if you if you follow the advice, but then uh, Emotiva's uh, Base X A300, 150 watts per channel, greater than 120 decibels, a signal to noise ratio. It's a fantastic two channel amplifier for 400 bucks. Uh, RCA inputs only, but RCA outputs on that Marantz. Now, if you want to go crazy on the amplification, you can get dual mono blocks. You could go Outlaw Model 20, uh, 2220s. You know, those are 200 watts a piece with a pancake toroidal transformer inside. Uh, but, you know, a pair of those is 700 bucks, and there's not really a need to pay that. You can go absolutely nuts with a monolith from Monoprice, a uh, 2X monoprice monolith for $1,100 and 200 watts per channel there. But absolutely not necessary. 400 bucks Emotiva is what I would get. Now, here is why I'm using that Marantz as a preamp instead of using its built-in amps because I want room correction. I want really good room correction. And you can get a mini DSP with Dirac Live built in. This will be your crossover. Uh, this will take full range out of the Marantz. So you're going to set the Marantz as having no subwoofers. It's just going to be full range left and right coming out of the Marantz, feeding the two inputs on the mini DSP with the rack. That is going to act as your crossover and create the dedicated subwoofer output. This has two inputs left and right, but four outputs. So you could actually have dual independent subs even if you wanted to do that. $400 by itself, $450 with a U-Mic 1. So that's a good deal. They include their own calibration file for the U-Mic one that they send you, but you could up that to $110 from Cross Spectrum Labs for a fully measured, independently measured microphone. Right, if you not just to. a generalized one. That's right. One for the so U -mic, at this yeah. point, we spent about $1,500. So Tom is absolutely right on the money. Audio Technica, I'd point you to their ATLP120. Like I say, look around. There's a gazillion clones of this thing all selling for three times the price. It's $300. ATLP120 is $300. That is... There's, not, there's nothing else to get. Get that for your record player. Um, oh, we're not there yet uh, as, as far as the pictures go. So, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, CD player. I'm going to suggest you getting Sony's Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Uh, in fact, their $500 one, the X1100, for the simple reason of it also plays SACDs and DVD audio discs if you wanted to, uh, as well as handling streaming services. And one other reason I love getting a Blu-ray player as your CD player is uh, if you want to listen to concerts. You know, you can have a little monitor to just get things playing uh, if you don't actually want to have picture going right in front of you. And you can listen to concerts that way too that are on Blu-ray or Ultra HD Blu-ray. Uh, so $500 for that X1100. 1100 from Sony. Uh, also, one reason it might be worth it for a critical listening is it's got a really, really quiet spinning drive. You don't hear any noise coming out of that player. It's mm. built like a tank. Um, so yeah, let's see. Room acoustics wasn't touched on at all. I want you to get some acoustic right. panels. Now, I just went for one of Gick's 
packages that comes with six absorption panels uh, plus four corner base traps plus one of their enormous monster base traps to put on your back wall perhaps which is the way that they deploy it so 760 bucks can get you one of those packages if you want one with the triangular shaped uh, base traps instead that gets you up to uh, 1050 but 760 bucks is all you need to pay for one of those room package kits uh, subwoofer I'm going to point you at a 2000 Pro series it'll cover almost without knowing the size of the room yeah, though but, but that's, that'll yeah, cover almost yeah. any room really really well again I love right. the cylinders those are 950 if you're in a smaller room an sb 2000 pro would absolutely be fine um so that's what eight hundred dollars those ones um, I, I think so and yeah. then yeah uh speakers that i'm gonna point you to are ascends uh i, I i'm gonna go for the sierra 2 ex because why not go for the upgraded woofer as well as the upgraded tweeter uh those go for 1650 a pair some beautiful finish options available with those sierra 2 ex speakers and uh yeah there you go. That gets you to right about seven thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really touch on speakers at all. I mean, obviously, I have cylinder subs. Rob has yes. cylinder subs. We recommend cylinder we subs because we love them. Uh, part of that is sort of the nostalgia factor. You know, you like muscle cars because your dad liked muscle cars or whatever. I started reading about subwoofers and I saw the cylinder subs from SVS when they first started. And I was like, what am I even looking at? <laughs> Like, well, I don't even understand what I'm seeing, and I've been in love with them ever since. If you want a box, there ain't nothing wrong with that. They sound mm. just fine. Uh, I would, as far as speakers go, I would be, and I always say this whenever we start talking about high-end stuff, is I would be looking at For RDH. Sure. I am an unadulterated, un, unabashed, yep. not unadulterated, unabashed RBH fan. I have... Uh, I've met a lot of the designers, uh, the marketing people. I've... Uh, you know, I'm not friends with them or anything, but you know, I have talked with them and uh, I've heard many, many, many of their speakers. Yep. And uh, they are always going for the clean, pristine sound that that I like. And uh, I, one of the things I really like about their company more than anything is that if you buy one of their speakers, you don't have to worry about whether the nuts going to match right. with one of their right. other speakers. <laughs> it's just Pretty they are always going for the neutral. same goal. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'll, um, I'll mention the, the Kef be... LS50s too. Uh, uh, sure. Another choice sure. that, I mean, if you get some Kef LS50s and, and you're not ridiculously far away from them, you're about 12 feet away or closer or something like that, uh, if you're not liking what they're doing, um, it's not the speaker's fault. All, all three of the, the ones speaker. that we've mentioned are like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'd be happy with any of that. Let us know. Whatever. Oh, he goes mm -hmm. on. Okay, in a different room, Dale wants to install a dedicated home theater. This room is 14 by... 15 and a half ish and it's enclosed he said it sound side 10 grand for this theater the ceiling fan will be removed thank god <laughs> <laughs> i just cannot stand the fans that look like they have uh leaves ah, or right. branches for <laughs> blades it just i'm just like dude i'm sorry you've got to kill that thing with fire <laughs> anyways uh will be removed and the room will be painted and he only cares about one row of seating he tends to go with a 4k projection setup and the budget needs to cover 14 by 15 and a half right okay. not huge uh and the budget yeah it's not yeah it's not huge and the budget needs to cover the projector the screen the av receiver and the amp if necessary it won't be five main speakers two subwoofers uh ultra hd blu-ray player well, we already got that apple tv 4k and more and two more in-ceiling speakers there are already two in-ceiling speakers installed in this room so he wants to add two more to round out the 5.2.4 atmos configuration he didn't mention room treatments or seating it's being part of the budget but room treatments weren't mentioned there's two channel system either so those are probably needed yes room treatments should be part and of this uh, spoiler alert i'm going to point you to the exact same kit for this room the 760 yeah, dollars is... six panels four base traps one monster base trap right. that'll, that'll put you in good yeah. stead uh yeah two two subs in this room you can go i mean the pc 2000 pros that sure. we already recommended would go fine sb 2000 pros also, would be fine in 14 by 15 would be and fine and in here as well they'd be fine yeah uh carpet the floor if you can yeah or at least rugs or at least put a big old rug yep. down there um basically i would go let me see five point 2.4 so i would go with a 4000 3000 4000 series from denon for a receiver to get the sure. uh, 
X uh, XT thirty two Odyssey XT thirty two yes for the yeah I actually pointed to It'll... just just again because stock uh, so accessories for less has Marantz's SR sixty fourteen ah. which is the sister model okay, same thing, uh, same yeah, thing yeah. Um, that has nine amplifiers built in and you want five point two point four so you don't need any external amplification at all SR sixty fourteen from uh, accessories for less is a thousand dollars right now so that, right. that's about as good as it gets at the moment I mean. If it, if you just wanted to keep this thing real easy, you could go SVS all the way around the you ground. You certainly uh, could, the, SVS the, Prime. The Ultra Series up front, which is what I have, and then use the Prime uh, satellites yep. or one of the other ones for all the surrounds. Definitely. And then in ceiling, I would go Monoprice, whatever that six-inch Monoprice one is that you can buy with the backer box. I wish Sure, yeah, the, the Alpha stupid. Series. Alpha Series is, is yeah, pretty yeah. darn decent for a very affordable price. Uh, if you know what the two that are in there already and you just want to match those and they're not too expensive that would be that's, fine too of yeah, course that'd be fine um, too uh ultra hd blu-ray player you could go with the one that rob already suggested well i mean i'd go cheaper because be there's no yeah. reason to worry about you know the audio have, why, just buy a game system just get an xbox <laughs> that's true or yeah just, or a playstation yeah. 5 which you is know? a better ultra hd blu-ray player than the xbox series yeah. x is uh, although i mean again yeah. you can't really get one right now um so i mean i would yeah um since you're going to be going projector uh, I would point you to a Panasonic. Uh, a UB420 is what I would okay. what I would do for the Ultra HD Blu-ray player uh, when you're going with a projector in here. So Panasonic UB420. Uh, now I for uh, I I spent the lion's share on here on the projector, um, which is unusual yeah, for me. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, unusual so. for me. Maybe even but, if, if he wants a 4K projector, he's going to end up spending. Well, that's money just it anyway. Be because the JVCs are so head and shoulders above anybody else in the way that they show 4K HDR, especially, because they're they're almost the yeah. only game in town for frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping, uh, and, and it's it's so worth it. So the I'm pointing you to JVC's NX5. That is their most affordable of them, but it's $5,500. You know, so I'm spending the lion's share there, which normally I'd put more into the audio, but you can still get really good audio with the remaining budget. Now, thankfully... If you're going to have this dedicated room, uh, you can uh, look at Tom's article on AV Gadgets for figuring out the wall color, but spoiler alert, it's Sherwin-Williams gray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, dedicated room where you're going to have light control, curtains over the windows and that, um, you can save a pile on the screen because a silver ticket... Yeah. is going to be great. Yeah. Now, there you can get a 110-inch white screen for 230 bucks, and it's a really nice frame, mm -hmm. and it's a perfect white uh, for 230 bucks. So thankfully, the screen isn't costing an arm and a leg. Already mentioned the GIC room uh, treatments for 760 bucks. Uh, already mentioned the SR6014 Marantz receiver from Accessories for Less for 1000 bucks. So... Uh, I want you to get a couple of nice subs in here, like we mentioned, SP2000 Pros or PC2000 Pros. That leaves you with not a ton of money, even though you're starting with a healthy budget, not a ton of money for the speakers. So I, Yeah, you spent over half of it on the projectors. Exactly. <laughs> so I, again, sticking with extended acoustics, I would, I would get five of the HTM200 SEs. Uh, because those are easy to place. I assume that you might want to wall mount the speakers having a projection screen set up. Uh, the HTM200 SEs are sealed, wall mountable, sound fantastic anywhere you put them, and five of them is only 700 bucks. A fantastic deal. Right, you're going to spend more than the, on the SVS stuff I That's right. mentioned. So, yeah, you'll have to make some decisions there about sure. what you want. I, I agree. I think that if, if you're going to go with the 4K projection setup that you get this yeah but splurge a little again, on there it's a little unusual for us but it's yeah. in this case it's really worth it yeah all right jason first up jason did a bit of testing with this nvidia shield pro and uh, with it set to dolby vision turns out we were correct and his hd base t converter is the issue so he can either make do with hdr 10 or look into running a fiber optic hdmi cable but his question today is about diy absorption panel he already has he has already purchased the materials for framing and hanging uh brackets plus rock wool insulation he wants to print images on the fabric and that's where he's run into anal par paralysis by analysis or analysis paralysis <laughs> anyways in terms of finding the best uh balance of price, print quality, and acoustic performance. According to the rabbit hole on AVS Forum, my fabric design seems to rise to the top, but there are three fabric choices that get debated. Basic cone cotton, performance knit, and silk, silky... Fail. That's what it is. I just... It, 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 it's got to be full of flaily F -F -I -L -L -E. or something like that. Uh, F-A-I-L-L-E. It's just fail. 
<laughs> he ordered samples of all three and gave them the breath test and light test as well as examined how the sample prints looked on each basic comb cotton passed the breath test the best but the print quality was clearly a distant third and with this relatively loose knit it was easy to see through it with the light test uh, silky frail had the best print quality it didn't stretch in any direction it blocks mo most light but it seemed to be worse with the breath test the thin the th then uh, performance knit was kind of in the middle thankfully its print quality was basically indistinguishable from the silky filaly <laughs> and it was uh, a little better with the breath test but it's stretchy in one direction so he wonders if that will make it more difficult to work with than wrapping his own panels they were fans of each of these fabrics, and My Fabric Design themselves recommended either the basic comb cotton or the performance knits, knit on their blog, although that seemed to be mostly uh, based on sales popularity rather than per pure performance. Can we help him break his paralysis and make a decision on which fabric to buy? All right, I don't know why you're worried about seeing through it. Why? Why? Uh, you, people you online Th said to. That's that's why. Okay, so you don't have to worry about seeing through it. <laughs> okay, let's let's start with that. Uh, you're going to put it straight onto this, and, and the, your material is yellow, right? So if you have a very light print, and you're worried that you're going to be able to see the yellow through it, cotton batting is extremely mm. cheap, and you can buy a whole bunch of it, and it's just you basically just make your panel, then you tuck the stuff in just around the yellow stuff, and then you put the 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 fabric on mm. top bob's your uncle you'll never see it um stretchy can be an issue mm -hmm. when you're trying to center an image and not distort it so that is one thing now i wonder what he means by the breath test being better or worse because what we really want is no resistance and so the silky fail has some yeah. yeah so i would i would discount that oh, anyone really? that had resistance mm -hmm. as you were breathing through immediately because that just you know you're going through a lot of trouble to make this panel mm -hmm. you know you don't you don't want to hamper it by not allowing you know basically not allowing it to work as well mm -hmm. simply because of the fabric choice that you that you chose there um and then if you read not this rob but rob W's yeah. is that his last name uh, guide on our website for how to DIY your own panels. What he did, and it, this is what got me when I was doing it, is he printed a border that let him know mm. where to stop stretching, right. <laughs> basically where to attach it on the back. So he knew what the front dimension was, what the side dimension was, and how far you know, it needed to go around to get to around the side so that he just lined up those lines and that made it so that it was perfectly, you know, yeah. it wasn't overly stretched in one direction or another. That's, that is where I broke down. That's where I was like, I math, it's hard, <laughs> can't do it, can't. And then I'm very bad with Photoshop and all that stuff. So making the dimensions perfect, perfectly on there was not something I was very comfortable mm. doing. But once you do it once, once you make that box for your your printed panel, then you can put whatever image you want on the inside without a problem. Right. Uh, so I would follow that guide, and if that you're comfortable doing it that way, otherwise I would just pay somebody else to do it. Do, it, which is <laughs> do the I wrapping, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like the performance knit is the one to go for, even though it does have that stretch in the one direction. You start in the non-stretchy direction. Um, just make sure that it's properly centered, and that way, when you are attaching in the direction that does have a little bit of stretch, um, you're not going to overstretch it as long as you're careful. Uh, the print quality matters. It doesn't make sense to me to go for the basic combed cotton when the print quality just doesn't right. look great, because why are you doing it then? Why are you getting printed panels right. if it doesn't look great? So yeah, the performance knit is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, Colin. Colin has a Sony A8G OLED. He plugs his sources, an Apple TV, uh, I guess not 4K, whatever, a Foxtel, a, whoa, hey, Australia, what's <laughs> going on? A Foxtel satellite and over-the-air TV box directly into the TV. Then he uses a TV optical out, uh, audio output to send the audio to his entry-level Denon 250BT 5.1 AV receiver. His speakers are a 5.1 Paradigm Cinema speaker package. Everything from the Apple TV seems to be working fine, but with his Foxtel TV box, when he changes channels, he gets a loud popping sound out of his speakers, sometimes a crackling mm. sound along with it. 
This popping happens pretty much every time he switches between a satellite channel and an over-the-air channel. It also seems to happen when he switches between a 5.1 channel and a stereo channel, although not every single time. Is there anything he can do to fix it? Is it even a problem as in, will it hurt his speakers? Um, the, it could, the popping but doesn't it probably scare me much, won't. but the crackling does. Yeah, crackling's it, not good. I would, I would be, I'd be very concerned about your volume when all this stuff was happening. I would make sure the volume was low. Mm. But um, I don't know if it's that it's, that's to blame. Oh no, no, no! I don't think it's to blame. I'm saying I would keep my volume right. low so that the crackling and the popping didn't hurt my speakers. It, it might be independent of volume, though. Sometimes these things are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the number. I've had this problem before. Yeah, the number one thing I would do is just try plugging that Foxtel satellite slash over the air TV box into the AV receiver instead of into the television and going optical back from the television. Because sometimes it's the the audio circuitry inside the television that has problems with right. switching between things. So I would I would try plugging straight into the AV receiver. Uh, I mean you could even do that via optical, but the the AV receiver that you has, it actually passes 4K and HDR. That 250BT does not handle Dolby Vision, so that's probably why he didn't want to plug his Apple TV into the uh. Denon, because uh, the Sony OLED that he has handles Dolby Vision, so that might be the reason he didn't want to do that, but your Foxtel satellite box doesn't have Dolby Vision, so um, you absolutely wouldn't be losing anything on the video side plugging that into the Denon and then the Denon into the TV. So give that a try, because if it's as simple as that, that's, then, that's good, yeah. Yeah. you know, that great because the Apple TV, he said, has been working fine with the connection path that he's using. So uh, if that does it, great. Now, if it doesn't, first of all, now we know it's the Foxtel box that's to blame. Well, which is what we says we all suspect this anyway. Yes, me. it's 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 it is the Foxtel box. I mean, I. But it's I, the question of is it that you know there's something in the signal it sends out that right. only trips up the audio circuitry of the television, and it wouldn't trip up the audio circuitry of your the dead. It might be better at handling right. it. It was Rob, what, what, Rob, what Rob is suggesting, and I completely 100 percent agree. Though. It may it not, may, it, in which it very case, well might not. Yeah, yeah. The, you you need to be calling Foxtel and getting exactly. Fox. Yeah, because the crackling, like I say, the popping probably not going to hurt your speakers, but the crackling that could mean really bad distortion is potentially yeah. what's causing them. that. That could be a problem. So if if it still happens with the Foxtel satellite box plugged into the Denon uh, before the television, then uh, call Foxtel because that's about all you can do at that point. Yeah. And pray. I mean, know. I guess you could. They may try to upsell you to like a DVR or better right. DVR or a different DVR. I guess you or could use the, you. Uh, the two channel analog output and forego a surround sound altogether out of the Foxtel box because that'll probably work. But yeah, that might work. That could, but it might not. You also lose <laughs> surround sound audio that way. So well, you could upmix it, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. Jens, Jans, Hans in Copenhagen. We all know. I don't think it's Hans. I think it's Jens. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes some c countries pronounce it as H's. Yeah. So who knows? I don't know. Denmark. I've been to Copenhagen. Mm, I have not. One time. It was beautiful. I, I really did like Denmark quite mm. a bit. It was lovely. I would go there. Not now. It's cold. <laughs> but I would go there when it was not. Everywhere cold. is cold compared to Florida. This is true. We were all very m miffed. <laughs> That we had to put on hoodies again. Ah, we, were, well. we were already we were already down to flip flops and shorts. You would need a like, hoodie in Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I would. I mean, I might actually use yeah. two. I don't know. Uh, Jan and his girlfriend recently moved. Jan and his girlfriend recently moved, and the and the room for his theater is in the new place is small, about ten feet long and fourteen feet wide. Thank you for converting it from yes, centimeters for did. me. But it's open on the right side to the kitchen and dining area. There are windows on the left. The love seat is right up against the back wall and won't be moving, he says before we start talking at him for a long time. There's a coffee table in front. The front speakers are in a cabinet TV stand with this fifty five inch L G C nine OLED on top. And other than a small rug, all the surfaces are hard. This is not atypical for the European countries and Denmark in particular. Mm. He's using SVS Prime speakers with dolly surrounds that are mounted close to the ceiling on his side walls, firing straight at each other uh, right against the black wall. He's got uh, a single SVS PB1000 sub 
Well, that's not fitting in here very well, is it? And his receiver is an older Onkyo 818. He's using HDMI switch with uh, audio extraction so he can feed 4K uh, video to the, his OLED and feed just the HDMI audio to his older Onkyo. There we go. Nice little solution mm-hmm. there. Uh, yep. Uh, this looks very clean. Very, very nice. Um, and it's not even fully set yeah, up yet. That's a, so, yes. Yeah, it's a built-in everything. And uh, yeah. So this is a, a cabinet that the doors are, have speaker grill. Right on them so that you can put your speakers inside there even but though they're, they're very low inside there they're very low they are quite yes. low yes and his surround speakers are quite mm-hmm. high and there's a bunch of legos on the ground so he has children's mm-hmm. i think we're assuming like who knows maybe he yes. plays with them <laughs> on the hard ground come on rob yep. no, our, our knees don't work like that anymore <laughs> not even in copenhagen <laughs> This is a nice place. I like your yeah. little hood vent in there, buddy. Right. And that weird triangular mirror thing is cool, too. <laughs> so he wants to know what should be his first order of business to improve his setup. He's thinking acoustic treatments, but where should they go? Literally everywhere. <laughs> Pretty much anywhere they can. Now, number um, one is the back wall. Kids, you're, yeah, the back wall. You got to get Since you're telling us you will not move this couch, right. which is a low... Tradition, yeah, you know, low back. He's got a bunch of pictures back there. Yeah, um, they look like actual art drawn by yes. somebody. It doesn't look like it is, you know, stuff you purchased. So I'm gonna say those would make great panels. That's right. You take some <laughs> high resolution photographs of them and get those very same images or printed on yeah. some panels. And uh, yeah, there you go. You can have the same look, but with acoustic benefits. So definitely, pa- I mean, cover that whole back wall if you can. I, I probably not, but as much as you can. Now, looking yeah. over at his left wall, which has a couple of windows, he does have a wide, I mean, kind of column thing in between the two windows. Yeah. You can put a panel there. I mean, it's it's not ideal for first reflection or anything, but you can put a panel there. We're just trying to cut down reflections in this room. Over on the right-hand side, it won't be you know perfectly symmetrical to the one on the left, but where that cool looking diamond mirror thingy is i mean that that could be a panel instead or to the behind that chair yes you should you could put like a tri trap or something like that i would highly recommend what you do is just get panels that are the same color as your walls or if you go for accent color like he's got other grays and browns in here so if if you want to match the accent colors you already have that could look good and these things are so easy. And like my, what I like to do is I like to get them square. Yeah. I know that rectangular or, or whatever, get them square, and then you can hang them as diamonds. That's right, because you already got the diamond in... thing going on that one thing yeah. over there, right there. So you can have diamond panels. You could get, you know, a pattern of different colors so that it doesn't look like acoustic treatments. It looks like decoration, and and that could work. Yeah. They have hexagonal shapes. And that ones back too. wall yeah. that you have behind you, you could like actually diamond it up back there you know with white ones and gray ones and do sort of a pattern that whole back wall and a rug Mm -hmm. and i mean (laughs) front wall if you want to match the wall color and have some panels on the front wall in behind your tv and on either side of the tv like it would any anywhere that you can but number one that back wall has to get treated and uh yeah there you go (laughs) yeah um i i I do 100 percent agree that you should do a you know, room treatments yeah. first. That's going to be your biggest yep. your biggest issue, and it will help the rest of the sound. You That's know, right. it'll help just in general. Like I want more. I want sound absorbers in my kitchen. Sure. I'm trying to convince my wife that we should get some, and she's like, no. <laughs> but uh, once we get these pa- these printed panels, I told her, you know, we there's a couple places we want to put art, but we don't have mm. any art to put there. I'm like, well, if we're going to put art there, anyways, mm-hmm. we can just get a printed panel and pick a i'm like there i there's a lot of free art out there that you can have printed onto a massive panel and throw it up on your wall and bob's your uncle uh lastly he says since his front three speakers have to live in the tv cap (laughs) there's many more after this oh there's more there's more after that oh okay i'm sorry since his front sorry this is the last one i'm answering (laughs) after this i'm leaving sorry yans whatever your name is that if that is your name it isn't (laughs) it isn't oh dear (sighs) so just hey when you're, if your girlfriend's listening to this, you just tell her, I'm sorry that mm. the Americans are so rude because we are. I'm sorry. 
All right, since his front three speakers have to live in the TV cabinet, uh, he was thinking of uh, lining the inside of the cabinets with foam. Any tips to get this compromised speaker placement sounding its best? Yeah, foam sucks. Yeah, don't do foam. So, get some don't do foam. cheap get some insulation. insulation. Uh, I would probably yeah. go for the the white, you know, either the Dacron stuff or if you have the same white insulation that they use to stuff in uh, like garage you know, the overhead part of garages. That's what we use in Canada. It's super cheap. It's white. And I would fill the entire back of the cabinet spaces in behind the speakers as long as there's nothing else important back there. Yeah. Cheap and fill it up. Don't don't like stuff right. it tight. Just fill right. all that space back there with cheap white insulation. I mean, I would consider putting it to the sides too. Well, know, yeah. And above. Like, fill everywhere. all the gaps. That's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't do acoustic full. That's that's yeah. waste. So should he sell his Dolly surrounds and replace them with SVS speakers so they all match? If he does, should he pay a bit more to get the prime elevations or would the prime satellites be okay? They have to remain the pie, so should they be aimed downwards a bit? Um, so the way he's got them mounted right now, it looks like they're straight smack dab against the wall and they're flush and they're yeah. hit. I think they're fine. I, th I think I they're, think they're fine. really fine too. I... Like, this would not I be a priority for me at all. No, no. I, I would be very happy to keep what you have. If you've if you've exhausted all other things and you've got money burning a hole in your pocket, which if you do have a kid, I don't know how that would be the case. But if that ever arose... Doesn't happen. Uh, exactly. <laughs> if that ever arose somehow, then okay, yeah, you can switch out those. But that, what you've got now, I would I'd keep. Yeah. It, it, the only time I would say that this might suddenly become a priority is if you started... If like we were talking about with the front three speakers, okay. right? If if there's a pan that goes around the room and as it leaves your <laughs> your front speaker and pans into your back speaker, it changes. You know, it's like it was a helicopter and now it's not really sure what it is now that it's in the back of the room. <laughs> I would doubt that with Dolly Sounds speakers. Very, so. <laughs> I would be very surprised. I like Dolly speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard a, a, a couple of their models and I've been impressed. So I would have no problems leaving those yeah. back there. So he's planning to wait until all the HDMI 2.1 issues and AV receivers are sorted out before buying a new one. With his Harmony remote and his HDMI audio extractor, he's making do just fine for now. But if and when he gets an HDMI 2.1 receiver, should he worry about Atmos? Is there any point in installing overhead <laughs> speakers in this room? Not enough you're going to keep those those surround speakers that high, honestly. I mean, again... there's no place to put Th them, this might be really. an even lower priority to me than yeah. replacing the surround speakers i it, not a priority at all again if you did it i'm not gonna yell at you or something like that but right um the, the not a priority in the least to me yeah i would agree so he's noticed how current receivers offer offer Dolby Height virtualization and DTS Virtual X for setups where you do not have physical overhead speakers. Would that be good enough? Do these virtual height speakers work fairly well? <laughs> I mean, you, when you get your receiver, you're going to try it anyways. Sure. So you could try it. Why don't you try it and tell us? Because my my what I would do is never ever turn that off. Mm for any reason whatsoever because I, I wouldn't even know where to find it and I okay. wouldn't care enough to look. I mean, I've, I've, you know I've I mean? tried it and with like specifically with the Dolby Atmos demo material, you know, like they've got that one that's got the little the little ping pong ball that's playing sounds right. in a circle around in a dome around you and they've got the, the helicopter demo scene specifically to show sounds going overhead and it's like, yeah, you switch between basic 5.1 and Dolby height virtualization, you're like, okay, yeah, if anything, it sounds more diffuse, right? That's basically what it is. It sounds a bit more diffuse and a little less pinpoint with the virtualization turned on. If you like it, it's a listening mode. You, you can turn it off anytime you want. So, I mean, there's really zero harm in turning it on and giving it a try and then flicking back to regular 5.1 and deciding for yourself which one you prefer and it, it very well could be content by content um do they sound exactly like actual speakers overhead no um so yeah that's about it <laughs> All right. Uh, can you still benefit from object-based audio with just a 5.1 speaker setup? Why does object-based audio also have to come along with overhead speakers? Is it all just a gimmick and a ploy to get us to buy more stuff? 
That is not untrue. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, part of it is a gimmick and a ploy to get us to buy more stuff, which is what Atmos is all sure. about, really. It, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that's what they're like, dude, we're at seven speakers. We can't, For our little else, crowd, it's worked we quite them? well. We have lots of people yeah. interested in Atmos and getting nine speakers. Uh, but object-based audio is not a gimmick Indeed. in my mind. Uh, Audio, object-based audio is a different way of, of encoding, recoding, yeah. mastering st stuff. And I think it is far more future-proof than uh, what we had before, which was channel-based mm -hmm. mixing. So channel-based mixing, you had five or seven speakers uh, at, on the floor level, and you mixed those channels. And if you didn't mix in the 5.1 and you played in the 7.1, then the... the receiver or the processor would have to say okay what's in the, the the surround channels what of that is supposed to be in the back channels and i'll split that out now with object based audio it says this is the xyz coordinate of the sound the sound mm -hmm. make it so number one yeah <laughs> basically what speakers do i have to know, work with how close can i get that's yeah Right, and then and then so the the sound mixer said or the sound designer says this is where I want the sound to be and this is the volume I want it to be at blah 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 these are the characteristics I want and he he or she messes with it until they get it just right and then they encode it now when it goes to your receiver you've got a seven point one point four set up and it's it's supposed to be in whatever coordinate it is it takes those speakers well if you don't have those speakers it takes what speakers you do mm. have so that means that if in the future we have 7.2.6 mm -hmm. or 7.2.8 or you know 9 point two point you know 10 yep. or something like which that. you could you yeah you can you can have 10 overheads you could. Five, five on each side yeah so it could use it, it it, though although the we're no longer worried about whether or not it was mixed into a channel because it does channels don't matter so there is a benefit to having 5.1 uh, object based audio, even with a 5.1 system, because when you expand your system, those extra speakers will be used as appropriately as they should be, rather than having to worry about the receiver properly, you know, decoding what is there and putting some sound into that speaker. Uh, this way, the the sound would naturally come there because of its its proximity to the X Y Z location. Yeah, I think some of the confusion is that uh, in prior to like this most recent year, uh, if you had right. an AV receiver and you said you have only five point one, not seven point one, it would never say Atmos on the front. It would never say DTSX. You had to have at least a seven point one setup for the front panel to actually say Atmos on it. But that's exactly why they've now put in this uh, Dolby height virtualizer and they've put in the DTS virtual x because now even if you have a 3.1 setup uh you can use that listing mode and it will still just take the atmos or dts x soundtrack and do the best that it can with it uh objects and all so yeah it's uh right. you're you're gonna have the object based soundtrack whether you want it or not and uh now you can play it back that that's why they got dolby uh atmos for headphones and they've got uh dts headphone x uh, two speakers you know right on either side of your head but it can play back the exact same object based soundtracks all right uh, anything else we would suggest to further improve a situation he's open to suggestions i've already forgotten what your situation is Let me back <laughs> oh yeah i think we've got because um, i mean the 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 panels are number one and and that's going to yeah. take you some time and some budget to sort that out uh, so that is number one, and the and filling up the uh, the cabinets with the uh, the Dacron stuffing, and and you're good to go. Yeah, I don't really see any reason to add more speakers to the nope. setup. Um, I don't see any reason to add Atmos to nope. it. I don't see any reason to change out speakers uh, in any way, shape, or form. I guess if you were going to ask me what I would do to improve the sound in here, I would take the speakers out of the cabinet and put them on top of the cabinet. But it's probably not going to happen. So, but it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, so room treatments are the number one thing. I think I'll make the biggest difference. All right, Byron. Byron has the upgrade bug. Mm. That's too bad, Byron. We don't do that around here. I'm sorry, sir. All we do is talk about how not to spend money. Byron. He's already got SVS Ultra Bookshelf and Center speakers up front with a pair of PB2000 subs handling the bass and SVS Prime speakers for surrounds. 
His ultra speakers have never let him down. He likes to really crank his system to high SPL sometimes, and the system has always sounded clean, clean and clear. Honestly, no complaints. Mm -hmm. But we've got some money burning a hole in his pocket, and he's always been very interested in RBH speakers. He's got a couple of deals he could hop on, and he can't help but feel like having towers up front would somehow be an upgrade, even though his head tells him his dual PB2000s will make it all a wash. He's looking for any excuse to pull the trigger on a per purchase. I'm going to already tell you I don't think you should need to have towers up front. Uh, I'm going to just tell you that right uh, now. I'm sorry. I just don't... It, 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 not only can it not... It will probably not make any difference as far as the amount of bass that you experience, but it could make... It can make it significantly more difficult to position them right. in such a way to get perfect... The, Imaging. You know, as easily yeah. as as your, your your bookshelf speakers, but whatever. RBH has offered to sell him a pair of their SV661R and SV661CR. So the R are the speakers and the CR the center version. are With the, the center tweeter version. tweeter elevated and, in its horizontal arrangement. All right. So this is an MTM uh, yes. mid-range tweeter, mid-range design, Di Diopolito design. With their folded ribbon tweeter. Yeah, uh, at a 30% discount if he goes for the Redwood finish. They aren't towers, but they have two of their upgraded signature reference woofers with phase plugs, which phase plugs are so They look cool. Hell. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> and their folded ribbon tweeter, he's been sure they can play very loud without distortion. <laughs> then he found a private seller, seller in Florida. First of all, dude, do not come to Florida. Places. It's a disaster down here. It's a complete disaster. Who is offering a pair of used SV6500R towers and an SV661CR center, but they're the older signature reference versions that still use a dome tweeter rather than folded ribbons. That wouldn't bother me that much, but let's go on. Price between the, the, the two offerings is basically a wash, so he tried the mental coin flip trick to see if he subconsciously leaned towards towers towards one rather than the other. When the coin flip said he should get the newer models with the folded ribbon tweeters, he was disappointed because can he just have towers, please? <laughs> I just want towers. So what do we say? Does he go with his heart and get the used RBH towers and center? Does he go with his head and get the folded ribbon tweeter versions from RBH, even though they aren't towers and aren't in a black finish? Or does he... <gasps> not buy any new speakers mm. at all since he honestly can't complain about his SVS Ultra speakers they already has. You should totally not buy any more speakers. <laughs> but since that's not going to happen, I would go with the new ones with the folded ribbon treater. At the very least, you're getting a technology that you do not have currently that's in your right. home. That's right. That's right. About, that's about the only thing I can say. It's like if you're going to do something, you know, and I think that the difference in sound between the RBHs and the SVSs is going to be negligible, <laughs> but maybe audible right <laughs> okay, so yeah not it, necessarily yeah, in a blind test would you be absolutely unable to tell them apart i wouldn't go that far but right um oh man i, I don't think you're, it's gonna I, that's gonna you're that's gonna, gonna be out like thirty thousand thirty five hundred bucks and you're gonna go i mean you're you will convince yourself with the towers oh, yeah. while looking at them psychology that they sound will, better. will win <laughs> You yes. spent the money. Psychology. They look like towers. You, you would convince yourself that they sound better than your SVSs, but uh, blind test. I'm like, man, that is uh, this is pretty close to a lateral move. If it's an upgrade, it's a small one. Now, the one facet where I can say objectively there is a difference to be had is that with that folded ribbon tweeter, you can have faster transient response. That that is an objective fact. It is something that I could point to to say, okay, that's. That's like that could legitimately be a difference. So if if you are going to buy some, I don't I don't think you should upgrade your SVS Ultras. To be perfectly honest, I I think maybe do you have more room treatments that you could install? Um, could could you look towards building your own media server? Um, you know, you end up spending that money on NAS storage or I mean, something. On, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I mean, you got four K. I mean, do you have a four K projector? Yeah, well, I, yeah, exactly. Do you have a JVC projector? Save up for that JVC, <laughs> man. That's fifty five hundred bucks. That'll take you a while. Because I mean, if you were starting with, you know crappy speakers that you got out of a cereal box then heck yeah you're gonna get some of these rbh's but from svs ultras man it's uh yeah big time diminishing returns you're at the point of now so if you must then my vote goes for the folded ribbon tweeter models yeah i i i just 
and, and and that is not to, to like if somebody else is listening to this, oh, I should you know, I was going to get some of the older R- the older RBHs would sound great, fantastic and speakers. I, I, it's I, just he I, already I, has fantastic speakers. Fantastic speakers. <laughs> I think if you A B like it'd be the same deal. If you A B them with the 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 folded ribbon mm-hmm. ones, you go yeah, I can kind of tell. Right. I think that they're a little bit right. different. That's the way RBH is yeah. though. You know, you get they you get a little bit more bass, you get a little bit more extension on the high end, you get a little bit flatter response, you get a little bit better finish, you get a little bit you know better you know louder as you go up the line. <laughs> you know, it's like you can just guarantee that's what's going to happen. But it all sounds sounds the same, except it's just a little bit better as you go up. You know, so what are you going to do? Uh, he says, is there a way to upgrade those older RBH signature reference models with the dome tweeters uh, to the folder ribbon tweeters in the future if you wanted to? I don't believe so. I don't think so. I think it's a completely different crossover and all that yeah, stuff. So it's a different. You could call RBH and, and ask them, but I think the answer is going to be no. Yeah, it's a different faceplate and screw pattern on the tweeters themselves, and it's a completely different crossover inside so i mean could it theoretically be done yes you know i mean yes in theory things could be done but it could be ch- just cheaper to buy. it is it is not as simple <laughs> as you will buy the new tweeters unscrew the old ones and screw in the new ones definitely not so no. yeah andy andy got a 4k tcl tv a little while ago so now he's he has upgraded his onkyo 805 from 2007 with a Denon X1600H. Honestly, there's no sound quality upgrade to speak of. Both receivers even have the same Odyssey Multi QXT room correction, despite the age gap. But this is about getting video working more smoothly, which it does. It's a nice to have on screen menus back, and the Denon doesn't get nearly as hot. <laughs> We haven't talked about an Onkyo yeah. catching on fire in a while, so maybe we should revisit that little topic, <laughs> that little gem from 2007. Although maybe that's a downside since he can't put his sourdough bread to rise on top of his receiver anymore. He says joking, which I know he is lying about because that will totally work. Um, if you're wondering, uh, back in the day, we had a slew of receivers that caught on fire from people who were calling us, and it turned out that it was like the video processing chip was getting real yeah. hot and stuff so uh, whatever anyways he's pretty sure uh his existing hdmi cable between his receiver and tv was from 2007 as well it's uh branded as radio shack so that's a throwback because i don't even think they exist anymore it's either 12 or 15 feet long and it would be somewhat of a hassle to remove it and replace it he tried it with his roku ultra plugged into his denon and 4k hdr and dolby vision all seem to work hdmi ARC also seems to work. So is there any pressing need to replace that HDMI cable? Is there some time bomb of a 4K 60 with 12-bit signal or something <laughs> that's going to crop up and annoy him soon? Or can he just keep chugging along with what he has? Dude, do not touch that button. That's what, <laughs> I, you know, whenever you're watching the TV show and somebody goes and they start messing with right. something, you're like, dude, don't press that button. <laughs> Everything's working. Yeah. Don't touch it. Yeah. The, Just leave it alone. The 2020 4K TCL TVs um, are not HDMI 2.1. They are HDMI 2.0. So as long as 4K at 60 with HDR and Dolby Vision are all functioning, there is no reason to replace that cable right now. Uh, if and when you one day get a television that does 4K 120 or 8K, because that might be all you can buy at the time you're ready to buy a new TV, since you just got a really nice one, uh, and a game system that's doing 4K 120 or 8K or something, well, yeah, then you'll need to buy a new HDMI cable. But for now, you're good. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, let's see here. In his Zone 2, he's using one of those in-ceiling speakers that has both the left and right channels in a single speaker, two tweeters in the middle pointing out at different angles. He didn't run the wires himself, so he isn't sure exactly how that was done. And there's an inline volume control plus an extension add-on to uh, to the wires at one point. So lots of opportunities to, for a mistake to have been made. He liked to test if the polarity of the right-left channels are both correct. How can he do that? The 9-volt battery trick doesn't really work, and so there's only one woofer, and you really can't see which direction the tweeters move. <laughs> he's, tr- <Yep. laughs> he's tried the basic stereo imaging listening test, but there's essentially no audible left-right separation from this single in-ceiling speaker. Since he can't really hear any difference, maybe it honestly doesn't matter, but he'd just like to know if things are wired correctly. So how can he test that? So, yeah, so if something is wired out of phase, mm-hmm. first of all, it's usually very obvious that you have a problem so what does that mean uh, out of phase that means that uh one speaker the red terminal 
uh, is connected to the red terminal on the back of the receiver, and the black terminal is on the back. Black terminal on the back of the receiver. On the other speaker, it's switched. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be switched by the wire. Sometimes the internal wiring of the speaker too, can be can be just, you could just be wired wrong. Uh, somebody you know messed up. And it happens. So, how do you know? Well, uh, first of all, if you've run multi Q XT, well, it, should... it wouldn't for zone two, though. He wouldn't have done it for, no, zone, two. for zone two. Well, I mean, you could always just rerun it and put it into the main zone and have it, you know, te- do that test that way. Uh, that'd be I one guess. way to do it. I don't know if it would work. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, but... at, the, at the receiver end, plug the wires that are going to that in ceiling speaker plug it into your main left and right for yeah. the main zone i guess i i would just like if you can unscrew that in ceiling speaker i'd attach a different speaker to the leads that are up in your ceiling and yeah you can do that you can do the nine volt test <laughs> with a, you know if you got a little bookshelf speaker lying around somewhere uh, 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 do it that way but that won't tell them that that won't tell them if the polarity is correct i well, should sure. i'll just tell them I mean, of the wires, if what he's concerned with is the wires, it'll tell you that red is going to red. But he's saying that there is there is splicing that happened in between, yeah. so the player could have been switched at any point. Yeah, but but I mean, so, I'm saying that you know you've got you've got red and black leads back at the receiver end. He's not sure right. if those still equaled red and black at the speaker end because it's gone through extension and inline. So if you connect a different little speaker there where you can see which direction the woofer moves when you just plug right. a little nine volt battery into it, then that'll at least they tell you move the same direction. Yeah. Both it'll ways, tell yeah. you if the wires at least are red to red and black to black from end to end. And that that's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if you can't do that, then you should do what Tom would have done, which is ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. it's supposed okay, it's it's a speaker that's kind of designed to have this more sort of diffuse. I mean, sound. really, it's just you know, about, it's a mono speaker. Yeah, like not so. having to output a mono signal. You can just send a stereo signal, and it'll play all the sounds, but not really in stereo. Yeah. So, you know, the only thing that would be out of, I guess, technically, if the, it's sharing a woofer, yeah. if it was out of phase you know the, when it was playing the same sound it would be asking it to pull out and push in at the same right. time so it would do nothing <laughs> and then the tweeters would cancel each other out i guess is how that would work out is that it uh, might even yeah understanding how those things work i mean i think that's how it works right it's in mono yeah so, you get a lot of cancellations if if one i would side assume of it is that unfazed. if it that if 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 you took and flipped the speaker wire on mm. one of the two on, on the at the receiver end and you flipped the speaker wire and then you played something through it and it got super quiet that would tell you that it is now out of phase yeah and then if you you flipped it back it would like, be if, then in like phase. let's say both the left and right channels both of them somewhere in the wiring the red got turned to black and the black got turned to red but if it happened on both of them then you're still okay like everything is 180 degrees out of phase but both sides are so it's still fine it's only right, if right. the left channel got flipped but the right channel didn't or vice versa right. that's the only time it's a problem yeah. right right because your ears can't tell oh if heck no the woofer went in or out first that's right. it doesn't matter it's only if one you know, of them's going only- out and the other one's going in when they should both be going out that's the only time you've got a problem yeah, this question hurts my brain. But yes, I think if you flipped it at one, if you flipped it at the receiver right. end and played some sound and it got quiet, that would tell sure. you it was out of phase. That, that's how you would do it. Infinite Gary. Gary asked Anthem if their new pre pro models are f- a fully balanced design from the very beginning to the very end of the circuit. They replied that their XLR outputs are truly balanced and that they use a balanced arrangement. That's a bit. That's a type of marriage, by the way, in case you're wondering. In a specific parts of the internal circuitry, but it is not a balanced design from the very beginning to the very end. That is not surprising because that's mm-hmm. hard to do and kind of a pain and totally not worth it. They pointed out that the whole par- purpose of a balanced design is to cancel out interference. So the two halves of the circuit have to be perfectly matched in all other respects. And they have to become a single ended. They have to become single ended at some point. Otherwise, the interference would never get canceled. Mm-hmm. So they claimed keeping the entire circuit in uh, two halves the entire time, just for the sake of being able to call it 
fully balanced, in air quotes, can actually lead to worse performance. They've chosen to use a balanced arrangement in small sections where it's possible for interference to enter the signal, and they go back to single-ended everywhere else in the signal path so that the interference is canceled out as soon as possible. And any possible discrepancy between the two halves of the signal is avoided. What's our take? Are they full of it, or do they have a valid point? I just could not literally care less. <laughs> I could not care less about this question. I could not. I mean, it, it, it fully balanced in, in these sorts of terms we hear bandied about mm. by the audiophile community as some sort of gold standard for how things should be right. done. And every electrical engineer I've ever talked to, every speaker designer I've ever talked to, every you know amplifier manufacturer I've ever talked to, when we start talking about these sorts of terms, they just, they roll their eyes so hard you can hear them <laughs> creak. They're just like... Oh, I'm just so sick of that stuff, you know, because sometimes they're like, we have to make a product that can make this claim or we will not be taken seriously by this small group of very loud people. <laughs> and they're irritated by it. And I don't blame them. So, uh, yeah, I, I just I don't even want to really give airtime to this kind of stuff, because most of the oh. time it's it's just not even it's it's not even worth discussing because it's just people being. You know, uh, I found out that damping factor was an important thing, and now I want to have the highest possible <laughs> damping factor, and that's the only thing I care about on on my receivers and amplifiers from this point forward. Damping factor is it, unless like you are annoying, go away. <laughs> well, the I'm sorry. the true fully balanced where it is two separate halves of the circuit from beginning to end until the very end when it's finally put back together right before it enters the speaker to cancel out the interference that was picked up along the way. I mean, it can be done, but Anthem is correct that if you have any discrepancy between those two halves, you've just created yourself a big problem. And keeping the tolerances that tight so that literally the only difference between the two halves is interference that's picked up by them, that... That is not easy. It is not cheap. It is not easy. And they are correct when, if you don't do it perfectly, it's a detriment, not a benefit. Um, right. Doing a single-ended design from end to end is easier and cheaper and in many ways can be better because as long as you shield any parts of the circuitry that are prone to picking up interference... Well, then you don't have the interference to deal with. So anytime you go to a balanced design, you are increasing the cost and opening up the potential of having a discrepancy between the two halves. Now, if you're running 300 feet of XLR cable, which you would be doing in a concert venue, it right. makes perfect sense that you want to do it because even if you shield that 300 foot speaker ru wire run, it's going to pick up some interference just by virtue of how long of an antenna it is. So it makes perfect sense to have balanced balanced outputs in a stadium uh you know but at home it's it's just not necessary just shield things shield them ground them properly and you'll be fine uh so what anthem said objectively it's true they didn't even need to do the partially balanced arrangement in sections they could have just added some more shielding they probably don't even need to do that to be perfectly honest but um yeah there it is the the fully balanced design i'm i'm not really in favor of doing it you you either got to be perfect at it or or well, it's, it's best avoided it's it's a lot like those speaker cable manufacturers are like where you know our inductance is better than any other <laughs> cable inductance that you can find measured anywhere and you're like yeah and now your resistance is through the freaking roof you know and uh, <laughs> or your capacitance or whatever whatever i don't i'm not an electrical engineer is now broken it like i we have made an amplifier that or whatever processor that's a fully balanced design mm -hmm. from end to end you're like great congratulations <laughs> it's seventeen thousand yeah. dollars and i'm not buying i it. hope your tolerances yeah. are excellent that's right. Carl. Carl's media room is upstairs, so uh, above his theater is his attic. He was concerned about his fire safety code as well as not being 100% sure about the positioning of his Atmos speakers, so he opted to use on-ceiling Polk OWM3 uh, speakers instead of in-ceilings. Most of the time they've sounded fine, but he did come across the opening of El Camino on Netflix, which I have not seen, which I think is uh, Breaking yeah, Bad. It's thing, the, right? Yeah, it's like a coda to Breaking Bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
where one character is talking to another from overhead and they actually mix his voice into the overhead speakers. That one scene made the mismatch in sound from <laughs> his polks versus the sand fronts and elac on wall surrounds very, very apparent. Mm. Yeah, see, the solution to this problem is don't ever watch that movie again. <laughs> then you're done. <laughs> So now that he's pretty sure he's nailed down the Atmos position, he's thinking the cleaner look and more permanent installation of insulins might be nice. He doesn't want to break the bank, though, and he wants to be sure he's within code. Again, attic above his theater. Should he opt for the model price and ceilings with their optional back cans? If so, which series caliber alpha amber? was alpha, by the way. It would be. Or should he get uh, sonnets in ceilings from Best Buy? They also have optional back enclosures, although they are glass-reinforced poly- polypropylene instead of metal, like the model price ones. So will those satisfy fire code? We are not fire code experts. Yeah, yeah. I would um, just call the city. Get man. the links. Yeah, call your city uh, now. I think there's a high likelihood that they would be because they actually have a gasket seal. So they are sealed. Mm. They have a gasket. Yes, they're plastic, but there's no reason why you know properly done plastic can't meet fire safety code. It certainly could. So yes, I, I would take the link. It's right there on the Best Buy you know, website. Take the link. Uh, ask your city hall and just make make absolutely sure. Um, but I I think there's a decent chance that they would. If that's the case, uh, since they are on sale for a nice reasonable price and Sonance in ceiling speakers timbre match wonderfully with Ascend speakers, uh, that that would get my vote. Because um, at the normal price, they're too expensive, in my opinion. But at the sale price that Best Buy frequently runs, um, yeah, mm. they're, they're quite reasonable and the timbre match would be great. So, yes, as long as City Hall says they're okay, I would go ahead on those Sonance ones. There you go. Now, we have no time for Camerons because this goes on forever. Uh, oh, I didn't even see yeah, I didn't even But scroll. we could do the very last one of Ian's because that's a very short one down at 13 there and then we would Holy just crap. have cameron f- to start next week. i'm still scrolling I know. that's why i said there's right, no way Ian. we're getting through all that <laughs> sorry cameron next week uh yeah ian ian has a strange audio gremlin i have one too i have three of them they're my ah. sons and they won't shut up it's just the audio <laughs> part he's using <laughs> it's hard to not talk about your children ah. and sound like you hate them <laughs> Just got to remember, they they're are. little mirrors of yourself, so every criticism of them is a criticism well, of yourself. <laughs> that, that, is, that is true. My my 17-year-old, he's like, it's like he invented being mad about things. I'm like, listen, dude, you don't even have a clue. Man, I was goth back in the ah. day. I had long hair and a trench coat and the, the California summer sun. Don't talk to me about being bitter about stuff. I invented bitter. I got so much bitter, people thought my kids couldn't even be bitter because I used all of the there's a skip a generation of bitter. <laughs> Don't huff at me just because I asked you if your homework was done. If your homework was done, then you wouldn't have a problem. The problem is you didn't do your homework. <laughs> Ian has a strange audio gremlin. He's using an NVIDIA Shield, older version from 2015. And he's got a projector in his setup. And as long as the projector is turned on, everything is, works fine. But if he wants to listen to music and he doesn't want to turn on his, his projector on, then the Shield sends out little pops and snaps. Like weird audio, digital digital audio artifacts. As soon as he powers on his projector, they're gone, but he doesn't want to always have to turn on his projector just to listen to music. His receiver is a Denon X4100W. Do we have any idea why this is happening and how to fix it? Well, that sounds a lot like an HDMI thing. Yeah. Like HDMI, HDMI, uh, HDCP trying to connect. I don't even and, think it's that. I think it's the yeah. cable itself because I ran into a similar issue with this. Uh, being that he's got a projector, I'm betting it's not a short HDMI cable i had one hdmi cable uh at one point it was yeah it was pretty long like a 25 foot long hdmi cable it was cheap because i wanted to get a cheap one (laughs) because i didn't want to spend a ton and uh it picked up interference um which when everything was powered on somehow that interference went away i don't know what it is about the 19 little pairs inside of an hdmi cable but when it was like sitting there passively if i tried to use the internet radio without the display being on or i tried to use just the actual like terrestrial am or fm radio tuner uh just interference and if i unplugged that hdmi cable uh or when i eventually switched to a different one <laughs> that interference went away in the audio signal uh and yet just like he described as long as the display was powered on that interference wasn't there so very simple test 
turn on your music, unplug the HDMI cable that you have going to your projector, and if the interference goes away, it's very likely that it's the HDMI cable. <laughs> uh, and yeah, if you tried to save some money, uh, I wouldn't be surprised because that's what I did and I ran into the same problem. And once I put a blue jeans cable in there instead, it never happened again. So that might be the solution and it's an easy test of simply unplugging that cable to find out. All right. Uh, our last question is going to be from Cameron and we'll get to you next week, dude. That is correct. Uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank uh, Jans, G. John. <laughs> it's just Jens. How hard is that? I don't. I think the S is silent. I think it's gonna yen? be silent. Could be yen. Gen? I think it's. At, I think. It, what if it's gen? short for like Jensen? Why wouldn't he just say Jensen? I don't know. <laughs> why? It... Why would he do this to us, Rob? I feel He's like. I feel it. like I'm being punished for something. <laughs> We're the uncultured so ones who don't know how to pronounce non-North American names. I. 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 I in the American people expect this of me. They expect better of you, Rob. Uh, you have you have let the entire European community down. The only How one I you should be tonight? able to get is French, and that's with a terrible French Canadian accent. Is the only thing I should be able to get. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> J E N S and Joseph. <laughs> I'm going to still call him Jens until he corrects me. And Joseph. Somebody correct us, Thank please. you for the PayPal donations. They are Maybe wonderful. Maybe his middle name is like, you know, Bob. That would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Thank you for the PayPal donations. Also, thank you to Andy and our, our other 123 patrons over at Patreon.com. For sure. Patreon.com slash Podcast. For anybody who wants to sign up, it's an automatic monthly donation. You set the amount. It happens every month. And uh, yeah, big thanks to our 124 patrons. Andy, thank you for being one of them. I want to thank Andy for shouting us out to Accessories for Less. Mike for sending photos for me to use on HV gadgets, which I haven't gotten yet, but I will get them soon. And our notes of gratitude from Jason, Aaron, Seth, Jans... <laughs> Like, I mean, somehow that save, has to be in our title now, me. doesn't it? I, I put save a different me. title in there, but now Save me from be. this. Save me from this name. It's killing me. God. Uh, Ken Byron, not Brian, though, at this point, I think nobody expects anything out of me. Carl and JR. Yes, that's right. Let me see. Where were we? Andy, thank you for talking us up to Accessories for Less. Mike, thank you for giving Tom permission to use your photos in perpetuity on AV gadgets until the internet disintegrates and everything goes away. Uh, Jason, Aaron, Seth, Jens, Ken, Byron, Carl, and JR, which looks like Carl's Jr. to me at this point because uh, we're this... we're late and, and getting blurry here. Uh, but thank you for Do the... Do you have Carl's Jr. on your coast? Do you? No, we don't have that. And all our, Har oh, all okay. our Harvey's just shut down. Harvey's is gone. We have no more Harvey's restaurants anymore either harvey's hardy's Har no harvey's harvey's you had harvey's we had harvey's yeah and so on this coast we have hardy's okay. and then it's carl's jr on the west I coast see. i grew up i grew up on carl's jr, I love carl's jr. <laughs> right. anyway thank you for the notes of gratitude thank you for the encouragement thank you everybody for yeah. continuing to listen and sending in your questions because that is how the show happens that's right and you want to get your question answered please send it in to question at abrant.com for AV Rant, I'm Tom Antry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.